Good morning. I'm Charles Cooper, the Associate Administrator and Director for the Office of Spectrum Management here at the NTIA. It's my privilege today to welcome you to the 2020 NTIA Spectrum Policy Symposium. The Office of Spectrum Management is very pleased to bring this online event to you, which will feature keynotes from leaders from the Department of Commerce and also the White House, as well as we expect some lively panel discussions among government policymakers and industry leaders. These are the people who are shaping our nation's efforts to make the best possible use of our spectrum resources. And we are thankful that they have agreed to join us today and give us the benefit of their longstanding expertise and vision for spectrum policy. As we all know, spectrum is the fuel for many of our high tech industries of today and the future, including 5G wireless services, aviation industries, such as unmanned, unmanned wireless systems and space commerce in the form of satellite communications and remote sensing, just to name a couple. Spectrum is also the lifeblood of the advanced equipment that our government uses to protect our safety of life and our national security. NTA has convened this online event because we believe it is important to bring together experts from all of these fields so that we can communicate, discuss, and debate the policies, approaches, and innovations that we will need to manage Spectrum into the coming decade. Spectrum is a proverbial scarce resource, and competing needs for spectrum access can generate disagreements and differing opinions on allocating that access. It is so important that these opinions are heard and, yes, even debated. It is also necessary to foster an environment of collaboration and creativity so that we can harness our capability for innovation and move toward real engineering and policy solutions. This is the third year we have hosted the NTA Spectrum Policy Symposium, but it's the first we've hosted it online. We have an extremely varied program this morning, beginning with three keynote speeches by our leaders in the administration who oversee our efforts to develop and implement strategic spectrum policies. After their remarks, we will have a panel discussion on the government's role in setting the proper policies, rules, and a supportive environment for spectrum availability in our growing high-tech economy. We will then hear from a panel composed of industry experts who will provide their insights on spectrum availability and also the management issues. Along the way, we will explore innovations in spectrum management tools, such as the Spectrum Access System, otherwise called SAS databases, and environmental sensing technologies now being employed in the three gigahertz band. And of course, what the future evolution of those tools we can look forward to. We will give some of the federal agencies an opportunity to detail how they plan to use the spectrum for their own advanced wireless systems. So let's get started this morning by introducing our first keynote speaker, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, who will put our spectrum policies in the context of the department's drive to accelerate economic growth and technology leadership in spectrum utilizing industries, not only in telecommunications, but also in aerospace and space commerce. Secretary Ross has served throughout the Trump administration, charting a course for government support on these important industries. If you may recall, he spoke a couple years ago at the initial NTA Spectrum Policy Symposium in 2018, and we are so honored to have him back again. Unfortunately, Secretary Ross is not able to be with us live this morning, but he has provided audio remarks for us, which he has recorded yesterday. Secretary Ross. Thank you, Charles, for that kind introduction and for your leadership with the NTIA team organizing this third Spectrum Policy Symposium. And a warm welcome to everyone joining us virtually today. My thanks also to Dr. Kelvin K. Drogemeyer, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and as Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information, Adam Kandiv, who will be sharing their expertise later in the program. When I last spoke here two years ago, the environment was quite different. Homes were not workplaces, schools and doctor's offices. But despite the challenges we experienced this year from the COVID-19 pandemic, the Trump administration's commitment 
to keep America's high technology, the most advanced and competitive, has remained steadfast. And as we advance through economic recovery, so does the nation's ravenous appetite for spectrum and innovative telecommunications services. Spectrum is powering the growth of America's telecom industries, from 5G wireless communications to unmanned aviation systems to the launching of next generation satellite communications networks. The wireless industry supports over 4.7 million jobs and contributes roughly $475 billion annually to our economy. So today, I will discuss three major administration priorities for its advancement. First, we are dedicated to winning the race to widespread deployment of 5G networks and high bandwidth services. These networks are game changers, the catalyst for exponential economic growth in every sector and field touched by the internet. A February 2020 study by ACT, the App Association, revealed that deploying 5G across the country by 2025 will contribute approximately $900 billion annually directly to the U.S. GDP. In President Trump's first term, we have successfully leveraged the increasing availability of spectrum resources to grow the economy and add high-skilled jobs. The United States has licensed a total of 6,290 megahertz of low and medium band spectrum for advanced wireless services, including 5G. Since January 2018, we have auctioned a world-leading 4,950 megahertz of high band spectrum that will turbocharge a wide range of 5G applications. And on August 25th this year, the FCC concluded one of several planned 5G mid band spectrum auctions, making an additional 150 megahertz available in the 355 to 370 gigahertz band. Moreover, in March through August this year, we made 380 megahertz in the 370 to 390 gigahertz and the 345 to 355 gigahertz bands available for 5G services. We've also made more than 1,889 megahertz of low and mid-band spectrum available for unlicensed purposes, including an additional 1,200 megahertz this past spring for super Wi-Fi uses. So you see, we're working hard to meet the demand from carriers seeking more spectrum for licensed and unlicensed networks and services. As a result, the U.S. wireless industry has rolled out 5G services in 7,500 cities and is offering coverage potentially to nearly 250 million people. The Cellular Communications and Internet Association now projects that U.S. operators will reach more than 67% of Americans with 5G connectivity by the end of 2020, including many in rural communities. Another important achievement for the United States took place at last November's 
World Radio Communications Conference in Egypt, where NTIA provided critical support to our U.S. delegation and secured important agreements on 5G allocations in the millimeter wave spectrum. This extremely high frequency will be used over wireless telecommunications to deliver faster and higher quality video, along with multimedia content and services. Our second national priority is to remain focused on building and accelerating American predominance in space commerce, a sector that we pioneered. Spectrum is a critical component of the satellites operated and used by the federal government for national security, for air traffic control, and for weather forecasting. And I'm pleased that at the last World Radio Conference, the U.S. government and the U.S. satellite industry achieved new rules for sharing between geostationary and non-geostationary satellites in the V band. We also recorded important accomplishments in streamlining the international approval process for mega constellation network satellites. The future of space is overwhelmingly commercial in nature. And as such, the days of dominance by government agencies and priorities over space exploration and commerce are mostly behind us. Over 80% of the $415 billion space economy is commercial. The American space launch industry itself generates $1.7 billion in revenue, solidifying U.S. leadership in this growing market area. In the past 10 years, more than $25.7 billion has been invested into 535 space companies globally. $5.8 billion was invested in 2019 alone, the largest investment year ever. Current industry projections place the 2040 global space economy at between one and three trillion dollars. We are dedicated to meeting the competing demands for spectrum in this sector by increasing spectrum sharing and improving spectrum efficiency. And we will continue our support for global harmonization of the radio frequency spectrum for space-related activities. Finally, our third national spectrum priority is to ensure the security and integrity of U.S. networks and infrastructure, both in the private sector and throughout government. Malign behavior by China and other nations pose high-stakes challenges to our economic and technological leadership, and therefore to our national security and well-being. China's state-owned flagship companies undercut competition in equipment markets around the world. The Trump administration is taking bold action to protect our national security and the emerging and foundational technologies essential to U.S. global leadership. Investing in innovative capabilities like 5G networks, next generation satellite constellations, and technical research are just a few ways we are securing our supply chains for high-tech products 
and network equipment. In addition, last month, the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security added 38 new Huawei affiliates to the entity list, further protecting U.S. technology from those threats to our national security and foreign policy interests. And the rest of the world is beginning to follow our lead. Our fellow democracies in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the UK, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Romania, and Sweden have joined the US in banning Huawei from their 5G networks. And now I am looking forward to today's discussions as we take stock of our progress in spectrum policy improvements and as we look ahead to ways to continue the momentum. Again, my thanks to all of you for attending this year's symposium. Please enjoy the rest of the webcast. Thank you, Secretary Ross, for your leadership of the department, which has certainly enabled NTIA to play a key ongoing role in the development of spectrum policy. I would like now to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer, Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP. Dr. Drogemeyer will provide us with a full picture of the Trump administration's key efforts to ramp up spectrum availability for 5G networks. The White House recently spearheaded the creation of the America's Midband Initiative Team, or AMBIT, which was effective at focusing on 5G and how we may get to a win-win solution for the 3450 to 3550 megahertz band. Dr. Drogemeyer will provide us insights on AMBIT's work with the Department of Defense on getting to that solution. And we'll likely hear from the Department of Defense's perspective on this later on in the event. Dr. Drogemeyer is the President's Chief Advisor on Science Issues. With a background in meteorology and extreme weather events, Kelvin came to the White House after a distinguished academic and research career, culminating in his position as Vice President of Research and Regents Professor of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma, where he joined the faculty in 1985. Kelvin is no stranger to government service. He served two six-year terms on the National Science Board the governing body for the National Science Foundation, including the last four years as vice chairman, having been nominated by both Presidents George H. Bush and Barack Obama, and twice confirmed by the Senate. We are grateful to have Dr. Drogemeyer represent OSTP in the White House in this pre-recorded keynote. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to provide a few comments on the process that we used to open up 100 megahertz of spectrum between 3.45 and 3.55 gigahertz. This work involved addressing issues for an array of different radar systems in DOD, all of which are very important for national defense. Now, as a person who works with radar data, I'm a meteorologist, I'm very familiar with the properties of EM and various parts of the spectrum. Mostly I've worked in the X band, the C band, the S band, and the L bands. So this project was for me both really important from a national point of view, but also really fascinating. So let me start with a key question I want to address uh, in this brief time I have with you, and that is, how were we able to accomplish in four months of time what had not been done in 10 years of effort? That is to make mid-band spectrum available for 5G commercial deployment without negatively impacting national security. But in fact, the work would benefit national security as well because our military obviously has to operate in parts of the world where such spectrum is in fact used for communication. So I want to tell you there were three principal factors that really were the reasoning behind why this project succeeded in the manner it did. Now, none of them is going to be new to you or perhaps seem really that significant in isolation, but the main reason the effort succeeded, in my personal point of view, and did so in such a rapid manner, is that all three factors worked exceptionally well. If you diminish or remove one of them, in my own view, the effort would not have succeeded. So let's talk about the first factor. We had a very clear mandate from senior leadership about the goal and a very clear deadline, August 1. And we met, I believe it was in April. We then wrote down the goal, and we parsed the words very carefully. The, the goal wasn't that long. It had maybe, I don't know, a dozen and a half words in it. But we came to agreement on what the words meant. 
Now, it sounds sort of trivial and simple, but this is a terribly important point because that wording became our North Star, and we referred back to it many times when debates arose throughout the process about very specific aspects of the work. We said, well, was that really what we were asked to do? Oh, yeah. Remember, we talked about that, and we all agreed that that's what that word meant, the word continental U.S. or whatever word it was. So it was very, very important that we as a team parsed those words, came to mutual agreement on what they meant, and then were able to refer back to them. That's the first point. Second factor is that we assembled absolutely top-notch people, world experts both inside and outside the federal government. We developed a very, very clear process and organized the work by service branch because that's how the radars are actually deployed in practice. Overall, there were more than 180 people involved in this effort. And I absolutely cannot overstate the quality of those individuals or the extraordinary time and effort that they gave to this project. These folks already had day jobs, obviously, and yet they gave a lot of time to this project in this sprint of four months to see it through to success. So that was the second reason. The third and final factor is extremely important, and that is we decided from the outset that we would work as a team. And to do so, we quickly built a relationship of trust and mutual respect. We had very open and honest debates. Sometimes they were very vigorous. We disagreed a lot of times, we debated, but we communicated continuously. And we never let misunderstandings get to the point where they caused a problem for us. So we also communicated continuously, not only among the subject matter experts and those that were doing all the, the detailed work, but also we communicated to the senior leadership, those who provide the charge to us. In fact, every given week we had multiple meetings. We briefed, we briefed the senior leaders every other week we made them aware of things in advance that we thought might become a problem, and we then worked to help keep them from becoming a problem. So those three things are the simple reason why this project succeeded. Number one, we had a clear mandate. Number two, we had a very, very strong team. Number three, we had very strong trust and mutual respect and continuous communication. And it led to an extraordinary result that is going to benefit national security, our economy, and bring to Americans the extraordinary capabilities of 5G very, very quickly. So I want to thank all of you who were involved with this effort because it's obviously been an all-hands-on-deck uh, effort. There's NTIA, there's, there's the FCC now with the auction, and all these things are going to play out now in the next several months. We're all a team. We're all working for the good of the country. We're all looking to make sure that we can, can lead the world in 5G and advanced communication technology, but we also want the most powerful military in the world. And thanks to all of you, we are achieving those goals. So I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of the meeting today. And uh, I really look forward to hearing the results of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Drugemeyer for your illustration of the administration's activities in marshaling the executive branch to deliver the promise of 5G technology, including the critical decisions on spectrum allocations and sharing. Our final keynote this morning comes from Adam Kandu, the Acting Assistant Secretary and Administrator of the Commerce of Telecommunications and Information. Adam will complete our keynote presentations by reviewing NTIA's role in its recent activities in developing spectrum policies and in making spectrum resources available in both federal and non-federal users. Adam joined the NTIA initially as a Deputy Assistant Secretary this past April after having worked since uh, 2004 as a professor at the Michigan State <laughs> University College of Law, specializing in IP and communications law. Also, Adam is no stranger to Washington having earlier worked in the FCC's wireline competition and media bureaus, as well as in private practice. We welcome Adam to our leadership team and look forward to hearing his views on spectrum issues. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for NTIA's Spectrum Policy Symposium. I want to start by saying how pleased we are that Secretary Ross was able to be with us to discuss the role that spectrum and spectrum policy plays in so many of our national priorities. That's likely a theme you'll hear throughout today's program. Even though we're virtual this year, we are very excited about the distinguished group of speakers and panelists that we have lined up, and I look forward to what should be a lively discussion. For those of you who don't know me, I joined NTIA earlier this year as Deputy Assistant Secretary after having spent the previous 16 years at Michigan State's Law School, where I served as Director of its Intellectual Property Information and Communications Law Program. Now, as Acting Administrator of NTIA, it's been my honor to serve under Secretary Ross as we work to implement President Trump's vision for American leadership. 
As you all know, NTIA manages all federal use of spectrum, and we are the executive branch agency responsible for advising the president on telecommunication and information policy issues. As part of that role, we also collaborate closely with federal agencies and the Federal Communications Commission and serve as a bridge between federal and non-federal spectrum users, especially when it comes to repurposing or sharing spectrum to increase commercial use. NTIA also coordinates federal preparation for the ITUR and other international events through the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee, or IRAC. In short, NTIA plays a central role in achieving the nation's spectrum policy objectives. The Trump administration has delivered on some big goals when it comes to maximizing America's spectrum resources, including support for the rollout of commercial 5G networks and the pioneering work of our space industries. 5G will be a foundational technology platform for our national economy. 5G applications are going to impact every sector. Our focus has been on working with the FCC to make sure there is sufficient spectrum to enable our national carriers to build robust networks and meet the demand for advanced services. This summer, we've seen some very exciting developments in the sharing of mid-band spectrum. First, the FCC recently concluded its auction in the auction of licenses in the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS. Bids exceeded $4.5 billion, a reflection of the intense demand for spectrum in the mid-band. Second, while the White House announced last month that an additional 100 megahertz in the band just below the CBRS would be shared by the Defense Department for use in private sector deployment of 5G technologies. These are critical achievements in putting more mid-band spectrum to use. They represent years of difficult collaborative work with our partners at the FCC, the Department of Defense, and the private sector. CBRS is a major leap forward in spectrum sharing technologies. This is the first time that spectrum is being shared dynamically between government and commercial users, with real-time decisions being made about inter interference protection and who can use the band and where. CBRS is, launching, is a launching pad for innovative commercial uses. An interesting component of this is the expansive range of entities already using or planning to utilize CBRS spectrum from new competitive communication services, service providers to enterprises of all size to companies in the utility sector. We are eager to see how the CBRS spectrum is put into action. NTI's technical work laid the ground for this summer's announcement on 3450 to 3550 megahertz, allowing the Department of Defense to identify a spectrum sharing solution that will significantly advance 5G without compromising national security missions. The result is that America now has a contiguous 530 megahertz of mid-band spectrum that can be put to, use power, put to use to power 5G networks. And this is complemented by the FCC's moves to make more spectrum available for unlicensed uses, especially next generation Wi-Fi, including in particular in the six uh, gigahertz band. Of course, our work is not done. We will continue to focus on making sure there is sufficient spectrum to meet our national goals. Those include the rollout of 5G networks, the pioneering work of our nation's space commerce industries, in addition, of course, to spectrum's use for national defense and homeland security. We will strive to create new approaches to spectrum sharing, including dynamic sharing models that build on the tools that power our current mid-band sharing mechanisms. And we plan to upgrade the tools and systems we use for federal spectrum management and promote more efficient and effective federal spectrum use. We must ensure that government use of spectrum best serves the public and the national interest. The availability of spectrum to meet the needs of commercial wireless transportation and aerospace industries is crucial in our efforts to accelerate economic growth, create high-skilled and high-earning high jobs, and maintain United States' competitive advantage in key high-tech sectors of the global economy. During this administration, NTIA and the Department of Commerce have worked to support American industry and its development of new technologies. We stand ready to continue collaborating with our partners and stakeholders inside government and in the private sector as we build on a successful foundation and create opportunities for the future.
Thank you. Thanks, Adam, for your summary of our efforts here at the NTIA to make more mid-band spectrum available. We are also maintaining the military's access to important spectrum that it needs for national security operations. We welcome your leadership and experience as we move forward in implementing the arrangements in the three gigahertz bands, which have begun so well with the CBRS rollout and auction. NTA will continue to work with all of our partners, in both industry and the government, to make sure that our follow-up work in the 3450 to 3550 megahertz band in our ongoing studies of other bands proceed speedily, but also thoroughly. I would like to thank all three of our keynote speakers this morning. Together, they have painted a picture of the progress we have made over the past three years in building a foundation <laughs> of spectrum policy that is empowering economic growth and technological advancement. We are now ready to transition into a live portion of our symposium with two panel discussions. The first, which I'm about to introduce, will feature representatives from the White House, the two major executive branch agencies, and also Capitol Hill. These experts will provide a government perspective on spectrum use, policy, and management. The second panel will answer those views with those from several major U.S. corporations and industries that rely on spectrum access to bring their advanced services and products to market. But first, let me set the stage to these discussions by illustrating how we are at this juncture on some innovations in spectrum management that, think, that we think will make a lot of difference in the future in accommodating many of these urgent spectrum needs that we have seen over the past few months, years, and yeah, even decades. It's not news to anyone that resolving competing interest in a finite amount of spectrum is both a policy and a regulatory challenge. And I also wouldn't be sneaking up on anyone by saying that making the best use of spectrum resources is at its foundational core an engineering issue. At NTIA, we are approaching America's spectrum needs in part by leveraging our national talent for innovative engineering. More specifically, we are looking at the best way to determine how and when spectrum is being used and then how and when it could be made available for other users and uses. The key to this determination is to make spectrum available that can be dynamically through the use of automated systems. We are referring here, of course, to what is termed dynamic spectrum access. We are already seeing an example of dynamic spectrum access being introduced to the market in the form of sense and avoid system set up for the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS, in the 3550 to 3700 megahertz band. As many of you know, the new market entrants will be sharing spectrum across the military radars in dynamic spectrum areas, or DPAs, along U.S. coastlines. Working with our co-regulator, the FCC, along with DOD and industry, NTIA's engineers have spent years developing concepts and testing equipment that would detect radar signals when radars enter the DPAs. This then triggers action by spectrum access systems, or SASs, to prevent commercial equipment from causing harmful interference into the military radars. The result of this, CBRS equipment and Navy radars will share the spectrum in these areas, allowing a nationwide footprint while avoiding taxpayer costs to relocate or redesign expensive radar systems. This is the kind of engineering innovative solution I'm referring to, and so many of you have played a part in making this a reality. Within the NTIA, we are looking at the next step in dynamic spectrum access and sharing, a concept we are tentatively calling incumbent informing capability. Rather than using environmentally sensing capability, the system will allow federal agencies to populate and update a novel real-time database with the frequency, location, and time of use information for these systems that deploy in the United States. The secure database system will then inform the SAS system, that's similar to the CBRS approach, that would govern any commercial equipment in the shared spectrum. This would open up a given band of shared use by a new entrant without harmful interference to the incumbent. Other advantage of the IIC could include, well, the federal agencies could gain greater control and security through providing their own accurate usage information to a database. The SAS, using this data, would govern the commercial user's operations, avoiding harmful interference. Second, the IIC could replace extra, less efficient layers of sharing techniques, such as the environmental sensing capability sensors 
required by the FCC and CBRS in that same band. Note that the sensing would still play a role in the future. However, the current sensors have some limiting factors. And third, the IIC could provide greater certainty for the commercial wireless licensee about the availability of spectrum than perhaps other sharing technologies. The IIC development is a joint effort between the NTA's Office of Spectrum Management and the Defense Information System Agency's Defense Spectrum Organization. IIC will be developed in a phased approach. Ultimately, it is envisioned that NTA will federalize and administer the IIC, so the IIC administration requirements will be included in any ongoing efforts of developing the IT uh, architecture for modernizing our spectrum uh, systems. So I mentioned IIC today to provide some context for our first panel discussion, which again brings together top government policymakers from across power centers in Washington, from Capitol Hill to the Pentagon. As we begin our discussion, we are enthusiastic about the future of spectrum sharing as a tool to maximize the utility of our spectrum resources. We are also so excited to hear from my colleagues in government about their own plans to leverage spectrum to fulfill their policymaking and public service missions for the American people. Before we're about to get started with that first panel, I do have a station keeping note. I would like to invite audience members to use the chat function if they have questions during either of the panel discussions this morning. You will see a place on your screen to insert and submit questions, which will then be relayed to the moderators for responses by the panelists. We will reserve time at the end of each discussion to answer as many of those questions we can already get to. And we've already had our first question come in, and that was, will this uh, 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 presentation, will this uh, 2020 uh, NTA Spectrum Symposium be available in a recorded format? And the answer is yes, it is being archived, and it, after it is uh, com uh, completed, it will be posted on our website. So now I will turn the stage over to Peter Chanhula, one of my deputy associate administrators within our office, who will introduce and moderate our government policy panel. Thank you, Charles, and hello to everybody out in Web WebEx land. Uh, we're live from Washington, D.C. for our first panel discussion entitled The Federal Agency Spectrum Use and Sharing, Supporting the Race to 5G. Hope everybody has their running shoes on as we're going to race towards 5G. Um, we have the uh, uh, honor of having four distinguished folks from the White House, Congress, and federal agency spectrum officials to discuss our current spectrum policy drivers, including efforts to make spectrum available for 5G wireless networks, as well as next generation satellite constellations. Federal policymakers will discuss how these efforts may be impacting federal agencies, spectrum access needs, and driving the implementation of new dynamic and cooperative sharing frameworks that Charles was just talking about. Um, my name is Peter Tenhula, a Deputy Associate Administrator here at NTIA. I'm going to introduce our panel, and we're going to proceed for about the next hour uh, in a pretty much question and, uh, question and answer format. Um, and then we're going to, um, but we're going to take uh, questions from the audience, as Charles mentioned, through the chat function. Uh, I'll provide um, each panelist with the opportunity to make uh, opening remarks and uh, expand a little bit on what some of our previous speakers have said. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists. First is Eric Berger. Uh, Dr. Eric Berger is the Assistant De De uh, Director for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, his focus areas in OSTP are in cybersecurity and telecommunications, which has included lately uh, leading the White House uh, AMBIT team, which we just heard about. Uh, Professor Berger is also uh, uh, on, on, on leaf uh, on detail uh, to OSTP from Georgetown University, where he's a research, research professor of computer science, uh, researching uh, and teaching on cybersecurity, network theory, protocol design, secure communications, and the policy aspects of communications. Eric previously served as the FCC's chief technology officer and had uh, quite a few uh, uh, numerous and exciting roles in the tech industry. Uh, Kate O'Connor is the Minority Chief Counsel for the Communications and Technology Subcommittee and the Energy and Commerce Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, uh, Kate previously served in a very distinguished fashion as our Chief of Staff here at NTIA and, office, and also in the Office of Congressional Affairs. We miss her quite a bit. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, prior to working uh, at NTIA, she uh, uh, staffed uh, Senators uh, Mark Kirk uh, from Illinois and, and Senator Dan Sullivan from Alaska. Uh, next is Fred Moorefield. He's the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Command, Control, and Communications in the Office, area, office of the Secretary of Defense. Fred is the uh, heads up uh, the Command, Control, Communications Office in, in the CIO and uh, provides technical expertise, oversight, and broad guidance on policy, program, and technical issues. Spectrum policy is a significant focus of his very broad portfolio. Um, Fred's previous position at DOD was Director of Spectrum Policy and International Engagement. He launched his federal service with the Air Force and served for DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency, and at the Joint Spectrum Center as a technical director and director of strategic planning in the Air Force Spectrum Management Office. Victor Sparrow comes from NASA, where he is the acting uh, assistant deputy associate administrator and director of the Spectrum uh, Policy and Planning Division. Uh, prior to joining NASA in 2009, Vic was the Deputy Director um, for Spectrum Management in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and Information Integration. He has served in other capacities in government for nearly three decades. Thank you all for joining us. I'm going to first open it up for uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, Eric for uh, any opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Tanula, for hosting us today. Uh, and thanks to the Office of Spectrum Management and NTIA for putting together this panel. I am looking forward to our conversation with my esteemed colleagues today. The administration identified 5G to be a critical component of the industries of the future. The industries of the future, besides 5G and advanced communications, include artificial intelligence, quantum information science, biotechnology and advanced manufacturing. These all require vast amounts of data and interconnection with many, many more wireless devices than legacy wireless networks can support. 5G will be a key driver of economic growth and improved national security. With that in mind, the president and his administration have taken decisive action to advance American leadership in 5G. We are accomplishing this on multiple fronts, freeing up mid-band spectrum, cutting taxes and removing regulatory hurdles in order to boost investment and accelerate deployments, securing America's communications networks from foreign adversaries, and preventing the spread of untrusted network equipment around the world, just to name a few. It is a simple matter of physics that to do wireless services, one must have access in one form or another to spectrum. This is why the administration focused NTIA on finding federal spectrum to make available and the departments and agencies to make that spectrum available for non-federal use. Under the president's direction, the Department of Defense, working closely with the White House, NTIA, and the FCC, recently announced the next tranche of federal spectrum moving to the private sector. Through collaboration that Dr. Drogmeyer described between the federal users and commercial users, we are making 100 megahertz of prime mid-band 5G spectrum available coast to coast in the contiguous United States. We're looking forward to seeing the FNPRM on the FCC docket this month in the auction next year. This process, which Mr. Moorfield will talk more about in a moment, resulted in the fastest availability of federal spectrum moving to the commercial sector ever. So thanks again for the opportunity to be on today's panel and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Eric. Now um, I'll ask uh, Kate if she would like to make a few opening remarks. Sure, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, you know, over the last decade, we've really seen a change in the communications marketplace. And in the last several years, a lot of uh, spectrum discussions have turned public, which, you know, is definitely different than what's kind of been the norm in the in over time. Um, so as we see the changes in this in the communications marketplace, uh, you know, regulations really need to catch up and need to also make changes to and modernize to actually allow the development to happen that's that's currently going on. 
Um, you know, Congress has played a pretty large role in the last several years over directing spectrum management activities uh, at federal agencies and among federal users. Through the Red Bombs Act, Congress directed the study of 3100 to 3550, so the identification of the 100 megahertz to be auctioned uh, hopefully later next year was uh, very welcome, and we're excited that that's happening. So with that, I'm excited for the uh, discussion today, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Kate. And I'll turn it over to uh, Fred Moorefield. Good morning, everyone. Um, bear with me this morning. I have a lot to say. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, NTIA, uh, for the opportunity to speak at your third annual Spectrum Policy Symposium. NTIA has been a great partner in advancing spectrum policies that support our warfighter and our missions. I want to give a shout out to my buddy, Dr. Charles Cooper, who's been a great partner since he's come on board. He's tough. We don't get along all the time, but he's uh, got integrity. He's got diplomacy, and he's built in that trust uh, amongst the federal agencies uh, and across industry. He's the epitome of a true leader. We strongly value NTIA's role in supporting DOD's unique and complex spectrum requirements. For the record, we also believe that the current bifurcated spectrum management structure has proven effective as long as it's respected and enforced with discipline at all ranks and should continue to be maintained. There is broad and bipartisan awareness of how vital spectrum is for not only commercial industry, but also to the DOD and the federal government. Intense industry appetite for spectrum continues to grow. Fueled by 5G, the next G and beyond, SATCOM, telemetry, and more, which has resulted in unprecedented spectrum congestion and constraints. DOD needs also continue to grow and evolve, both in bandwidth and complexity. Our operations to support modern warfare requirements require more spectrum for a diverse set of capabilities, from intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, precision guided munitions, GPS, space based capabilities, telemetry for testing, electronic warfare, and communications for emerging cloud, artificial intelligence, data, and other information based services as examples. We're also seeing near peer adversaries deploy more sophisticated tools designed to undermine our historical advantage in spectrum based capabilities that operate across all spectrum bands. I am not a soothsayer, but all of, this depend, all of this demands that we have to look at new ways to do spectrum management. We're long past the time when the U.S. can allow spectrum policies to favor one industry or a particular use. The era of spectrum policy is a zero-sum gain in which one user gives up spectrum to allow the other exclusive access we believe is over. Spectrum management must modernize. We are being outpaced by technology and demand. We must take a whole of nation approach and come work together to innovate our spectrum apparatus from dynamic spectrum technologies to moderniz the modernization of our aging spectrum management IT systems, the new policies and laws that support this new reality. All of these factors has led DOD to understand that sharing more spectrum must be how we move forward. This has led DOD to call for more spectrum sharing to be the new norm and to advance spectrum and advance sharing of spectrum with industry where and when it makes sense. We also call for improved policies and regulations that allow and encourage bidirectional sharing for DOD to access non-federal spectrum when needed. The stakes are too high and we must get this right. The time for change is now. The strength of our economy and our national security demand it. This is not just talk. DOD walks this walk every day. Let me provide some examples where we are working to rise to this complex challenge. First, let me talk about strategies. Strategies, as you know, are necessary to provide the vision and chart the direction an organization wants to go in certain areas and drive investment. Within the department, we have released several key strategies to modernize our operations, including our digital modernization strategy, our cloud strategy, our artificial intelligence strategy, and our five street strategy. Our data strategy will hope will be released soon. Just last week, the Deputy Secretary of Defense signed the command control and communication strategy. Our C3 strategy gets after modernizing things like GPS, SATCOM, Spectrum, 5G, and more. 
we have already secured funding that goes towards C3 modernization. We also anticipate that the Secretary of Defense to sign our electromagnetic spectrum superiority strategy within the next few weeks or so. The electromagnetic superiority strategy calls for more technology investment, changes to spectrum operations, strong partnerships and collaboration, new policies, and an enterprise approach to spectrum management. We have begun implementation of these strategies, and we believe that this will propel DOD spectrum sharing posture forward. Second, DOD continues to foster strong partnerships and collaboration with industry, the interagency, and internationally. We are active in multiple fora to advance spectrum sharing, including the National Spectrum Consortium, the Wind Forum, 3GPP, the Utilities Technology Council, National Defense Industrial Association, Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, ADIS, and IEEE, just to name a few. With industry members of the National Spectrum Consortium, the department is investing millions of dollars conducting many large-scale 5G experiments with the goal of DOD consuming 5G for testing, training, exercises, and operations, including experimenting at Fort Hill Air Force Base this year to explore uh, dynamic spectrum sharing between airborne radar and commercial 5G systems. Third, DOD with NTIA we're also at the forefront of several initiatives to make more spectrum available for commercial uses through spectrum sharing. In the 3.5 gigahertz citizens broadband radio service, DOD, FCC, and NTIA and industry collaborated and partnered to figure out how to share spectrum. In August, the FCC completed a $4.5 billion auction to share spectrum. DOD requested about 98 million of that to make that spectrum operate, to make that commercial spectrum um, make sure that commercial spectrum and DOD uses coexist as designed with one of our goals to revisit the CBRS rules at some point in the future. Second, DOD works at the White House over the summer, which you heard earlier, on an unprecedented 15-week sprint to make 100 megahertz of mid-band spectrum available in a 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz spectrum um, to industry for sharing. Auction revenue is expected to be in the tens of billions. This achievement is critical to U.S. 5G leadership. DLD also worked effectively with NTIA and FCC to free up 1,000 megahertz in the 37.6 to 38.6 gigahertz spectrum range with protections of 15 military locations. The FCC auctioned this band along with four other millimeter wave bands that place U.S. industry with access to more high band spectrum than any nation than any nation. Now DOD is working on a sharing arrangement in the 37, point, 37 gigahertz to 37.6 gigahertz band. Access to this lower 600 megahertz is very important to DOD as we seek to leverage 5G for our own operations in the United States. And as you all know, last week DOD released an RFI focused on moving the ball forward in several spectrum areas, including how we can make more spectrum in the 3100 to 3450 megahertz spectrum available faster. Our work here represents our commitment to sharing and working through our hard problems with real results. As I said, we don't just talk to talk, we walk to walk, or more aptly, I should say, we, are, we have been running. The 2018 presidential memo, the FCC's 5G FAST plan, and the push to make available, make additional mid-band spectrum available for 5G in the U.S. wireless industry leadership are required uh, DOD to move fast. So while some are quick to say DOD and NTA are slow in freeing up spectrum um, or considering sharing, that is just not accurate. We are working as quickly as we can without jeopardizing national security and in line with our, appropriation, our appropriations and statutory processes. Let me close by talking a bit more about the recently released uh, RFI, as I know has caused uh, a lot of swirl in the press and amongst uh, some of the folks on this, on this uh, event. As I have already stated, DOD is committed through not only words, but actions uh, to an all, above, all the above approach to solving uh, tough spectrum problems and challenges. We do need help from industry and rely on that strong partnership. The RFI continues the conversation between the government and industry on spectrum sharing, but is more expansive than the August 10th, 2020 White House and DOD announcement concerning additional mid-band spectrum to be made available for 5G. The AMBIT agreement was focused on sharing a specific band, 3450 to 3550 megahertz. This RFI more broadly speaks to capabilities and technologies that can help DOD advance spectrum sharing in all bands, 
including the important mid-band range of 3100 to 3550. Both RFI and the AMBIT agreement advance DOD spectrum sharing goals. The RFI seeks information on innovative solutions and alternative approaches to enable dynamic spectrum sharing within the department's currently allocated spectrum with the goal of accelerating spectrum sharing decisions in 5G deployment. The intent of this RFI is to ensure the greatest effective and efficient use of the Department of Defense's spectrum and tra for training readiness and lethality. The RFI is seeking information regarding all methods and approaches and feasibility to best develop and deploy dynamic spectrum sharing across a broad range of capabilities and for future understanding of how spectrum may be utilized by both 5G and innovative technologies. We are truly trying to understand both the art of the possible as well as as well as current industry trends and spectrum utilization. The scope of the effort is intended to cover all approaches to spectrum management, including the best methods of sharing spectrum in both military and civilian users. Please help us as we are trying to figure out what options are out there. As a nation, we cannot be holding to the current auction focused spectrum policies. As technologies enable more advanced, more advanced sharing, we will be able to move forward uh, we, we would be able to move uh, beyond sharing that relied on strict geographic separation. DOD believed that he who solves spectrum sharing will own it, so it's a national security imperative to promote and support innovative spectrum sharing technologies and push the U.S. to be the world leader in this regard. DOD is willing to lead the charge and is committed to working with all stakeholders to make this a reality. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and dialogue. Thank you, Fred. Uh, in the immortal words of Jed Clampett, "Woo, doggy, that's a lot. That's a lot to swallow." Uh, I appreciate uh, all you had to say. I just you've answered all my questions, but I have no other questions. Um, we do want to have uh, we do have a little time left to provide Vic uh, an opportunity for some opening remarks. Yeah, I'm not sure if Fred yielded his remaining time to me, or if I should yield in your mind. <laughs> Just to uh, to follow Fred, I just want to uh, to start thank NTIA, uh, Cook, Charles, and uh, and Peter for having us here. I think this is a very uh, timely opportunity, considering where we are with uh, ending the last WRC cycle. As you know, where we had a lot of challenges in uh, entering or coming up on the upcoming elections. So I guess to summarize what Fred said, what I heard is Fred is a very complex user, not just DOD here domestically, but it's worldwide. Um, operations and those things need to be taken into consideration. Uh, NASA, the, the, the same way. Uh, we cannot be uh, uh, assessed in a stovepipe domestic uh, environment. And usually that's what kind of makes our situations difficult because uh, like the scope of this panel was saying sharing, how can we share with 5G? Well, that's nothing new. We kind of always had challenges of sharing with broadband and it comes down to how can we get it in the uh, an MTI FCC US centric solution. Uh, but for space users, that's that's impossible. Just by definition, we're a global user. Other of our federal partners have uh, global uses as well. So traditionally, I know we always get down to time and money, time and money. How much time is it going to take? How much is it going to cost for you to go somewhere else? That's our traditional spectrum sharing template. Uh, and for a terrestrial user, yeah, you can put a cookie cutter. And you can say, okay, can you share within your operating environment? And if not, we'll give you the costs, we'll give you the time to move somewhere else. Well, you can't do that with NASA users because there's not only us flying over the United States, we're flying all over the globe. And then there's other space users that are flying over U.S. as well. So that becomes an international uh, situation. Um, how do we do that today? Well, at the lowest level, we have the space frequency coordination group, which we share or pre-coordinate with our space nations. Uh, very effective, gets all the space users involved, pre-coordinate, show where the problems are. And we take that to the ITU. And that's why I said coming out of the last WRC cycle, that kind of talks to um, where the solution needs to take place when you talk about uh, space users. So I just wanted to point that out, that you do have some very complex users uh, in this domain where we're talking about sharing of spectrum. So what types of users do we have? We have active users and passive users, which makes it even more difficult because as the active users, you can do your interference analysis and kind of 
whether you can share or whether you can go somewhere else. But we have passive users, radio astronomy, the remote passive sensing, where you get unique special resonant frequencies with different products. And in those cases, you can't go anywhere else. Uh, so in those cases, we have to decide how we're going to share. Um, and you can't come up with any comparable spectrum. There's no comparable spectrum. Um, so, so, so that's one of our unique instances. So where are we going? We're putting together a, uh, a strategy. Uh, it's draft now. We want to make sure it's consistent with the White House strategy, make sure it's consistent with NTIA and also the, uh, the NASA vision of where we're going. But what we're also doing smartly is commercialization. Uh, traditionally, we have our government-owned and operated networks where we have our near Earth network, which does direct to ground uh, communications. We have our space networks, which does data relay. We also have a uh, deep space network, uh, two million, uh, million kilometers and beyond. So we're looking at the near Earth portion, working with OMB and others, and how we can do that smartly and migrate uh, to commercial. So that's going to take into account partnering with industry. We also have a uh, uh, agenda item going into the next WRC cycle, and how can we do space to space and some of the commercial FSFs and MSS bands. But these are just some of the things we're doing where we're already looking at the partnerships and sharing that it takes to use to do spectrum smartly. Uh, there are some technological uh, advancements we're doing. I think that's kind of going to come up in the discussion, but uh, that's just some of my uh, quick summary of where kind of NASA fits into this context. And not, we're not speaking for NASA, speaking for our partner nations who are in this same complex situation when it comes to uh, uh, spectrum sharing. So with that, Peter, Cooper, appreciate it. Turn it back over to you and look forward to the entertaining discussion. I appreciate everybody's uh, um opening thoughts uh let me just uh quickly turn it back to fred for for a second and then i'll guess um kate or eric if you have any kind of reactions to what, what fred was talking about it get a more any more detail in kind of the uh we've been hearing a lot about the mid-band spectrum we heard about ambit and the success there you you mentioned the, uh, the request for information about uh, dynamically sharing um spectrum uh, can you d dig a little deeper into what you're thinking about kind of the, the requirements that are, you know, necessary to protect federal, federal radar users and at the same time enabling, you know, new 5G service providers? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it depends, right? So um, in 5 gigahertz, we work, we developed uh, dynamic frequency selection uh, in CBRS. We came up with the SAS ESC approach. Uh, working with the AMBIT team, we came up with a new construct to, to share spectrum in that spectrum band. Uh, from my perspective, I think it depends, right? So um, the RFI and the beauty of the RFI is, and this collaboration and partnership is key because we within DOD know that we don't know everything. And uh, reaching out to industry, um, you know, getting uh, the best and brightest from academia, small business, um, that partnership and collaboration is key. So we're open to new innovative ideas. Again, we've come up with ways to do it in these different um, um, sharing regimes that we've come up with so far, but we're looking for new innovative ideas how to do that. I'm a technology kind of guy, you know, so I, we're moving in the department to, um, um, you know, to autonomous kind of capabilities. I think that's the ultimate nirvana and where we're going to go eventually. But in the interim, um, you know, we got to get there. And to get there, I think we're going to need the best and brightest from across the government and industry coming together uh, to figure out how to do this and do this right. So um, that, that's the beauty of what that RFI is trying to do. Over. Thanks, Fred. Um, Eric, you've had some experience raising money for research and development in your past lives. Um, uh, what kind of investments do you think are needed in, in spectrum management tools and techniques? Um, and and what, how should policymakers embrace this kind of um, investment challenges? Sure, Peter. Well, last year, the administration released the federal R&D priorities for spectrum and the uh, report, the impact on emerging technology on non-federal spectrum demand. And so addressing those priorities, uh, the National Science Foundation has its $100 million public-private partnership for advanced wireless research or power. And that funds four test beds. They focus on smart city, dense urban, UAV communications, and rural broadband, because you need users 
to you know, figure out what these networks are going to be doing. It's also important to point out that the novel technology that underpins this uh, citizens broadband radio service that we've talked quite a bit about today was the result of NSF sponsored spectrum research. So looking forward, and as Fred mentioned, you know, we're looking for the next next. Uh, the NSF has a $12 million program called Spectrum and Wireless Innovation Enabled by Future Technologies, or SWIFT. And that focuses on effective spectrum utilization or coexistence techniques. Uh, and, you know, knowing the needs of, uh, say, NASA, one of the focuses here is that it's especially uh, taking in consideration passive users, so not just bands, but maybe broadband with uh, uh, passive Earth observation platforms. Uh, in order to build a national scale research center, the NSF is going to be standing up a new national center for wireless spectrum research. Uh, so far this year, it's awarded 17 planning grants, and the goal is to uh, stand up a center funded at a level of $25 million, and again, academic, public, private uh, consortium. Uh, but we also have to note that investments in 5G and wireless and spectrum sharing is really a broad lift. For example, the U.S. is holistically making investments in not only advanced wireless, but cybersecurity, supply chain security, keeping standards bodies open, transparent, and ensuring that standards are based on the best technical solution as opposed to solutions that favor a particular country's politics or domestic champion. And all of those investments help advance American leadership in wireless spectrum sharing and 5G. Interesting. Um, let me, uh, we got a couple audience questions coming in, but uh, before we get to those, I'll talk to, uh, ask Kate to, uh, uh, Fred mentioned in his keynote speech about the bifurcated system uh, that uh, we we currently operate on. The uh, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee recently reviewed several options for uh, changing the uh, the current structure governing U.S. spectrum management and policy development. Uh, and many of these options may likely require legislation. Um, and what is your, what is your take on these these governance issues? So thank you for the question. Um, you know, over the past four years, this administration has really done a great job in terms of making spectrum available and setting out a, a spectrum strategy to help continue to make spectrum available um, to the commercial sector for deployment. You know, I think um, there have definitely been in the past couple of years, a lot of spectrum debates that have uh, played out in the public sphere as Vic was talking about. Um, and this really ultimately is an engineering problem. So the, these decisions need to be based on facts. I think that they're def the CSMAC recommendations are definitely something to think about. But one thing that we are seeing that is very clear is that NTIA needs to be the coordinator and continue in its coordinating role in terms of uh, speaking, I guess, across all the federal agencies for their spectrum needs. And that's something that, you know, I, I feel that we've been seeing a lot more of individual agencies working on individual spectrum priorities. And unfortunately, when it comes to spectrum management, if we're actually going to make large swaths of spectrum available for commercial use, it needs to be done in a holistic way. Um, you know, Congress anointed NTIA with this coordinating role for that reason. So we really can't have agencies working in their silos um, and doing the spectrum work. And just to comment really quick before we turn on to turn over to um, audience questions, if it's all right, uh, you know, I think that that management structure does need to be enforced, as Fred was talking about. Um, I think with I, the identification of 3450 to 3550 to be available for auction in such a short time frame, it really does show that the government is willing to work on this and that it can be done. In 3.5, we saw the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences really work on the ESC, ESC and SAS uh, capabilities and working with industry to get that right. Um, so there are innovative ways to make this available. So, you know, I think with 
the RFI going out. I think that's great to get more information to identify new innovative innovative ways ways of spectrum sharing. But we also have identified the 3450 to 3550, and we need to make sure that that gets available, uh, made available as soon as possible. Great, and thank you, thank you for that reminder, and uh, can't agree more on on that. Um, let me ask uh, Vic about 5G on the moon, 5G on Mars. Is that what you, you're envisioning for NASA? Um, so not just 5G, we're looking at, at lots of things. So specifically the 5G, we're looking at LTE and 5G and how we're going to be able to use it uh, in terms of the commercial networks that are going to be providing com communications and nav to the moon and then also in situ uh, at the moon from surface to, to, to lunar relays. We're looking at 5G and LTE and some of the standards and protocols uh, that we can uh, use. So. The Artemis effort in the direction to get the uh, the next man and the first woman on the moon by next, by 2024, that is not going to be a uh, government exclusive solution. That is going to be a holistic solution to involve federal partners, to involve commercial industry, and we're moving quickly to see what is the best solution. So 5G is part of that uh, trade space. So even though we've had some uh, difficulties last cycle in some of the debates with 5G, we have always been uh, all in with 5G and support of 5G being a national interest, but you also have to take into account some of the other interests and very important interests that we have that are global in terms of human space flight, in terms of science, exploration, and uh, even aeronautics. And it doesn't always have to be a either or. I think you get the smart people, you get the right technologies, you can come up with solutions. Uh, as in this case said, it is a, it's a technical solution. It doesn't have to be a political. Uh, I think you agree on the assumptions, you agree on the uh, the scenarios, the deployments that go into the models, the maps take care of themselves. Then you all come out with the same solution. I think where we struggle sometimes is what is the data in that's going into some of these models. So uh, long answer, but 5G, yes, we're all in. Uh, we are all in also in trying to find a better way to do spectrum sharing, whether it be the models, the data for the models, or whether it be technologies, some of the technologies we've been looking at. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm starting to uh, look at some of the questions we're getting um, from the audience and uh, it's kind of seeing a little theme developing. I want to just boil it all down and then turn to some of the specific questions um, because it seems like the, the, the lines between what traditionally has been federal, non-federal, commercial, non-commercial are, are really blurring here. And this kind of feeds into this first question about kind of new approaches um, in light of those blurring lines where you've got uh, what Vic was just describing is um, kind of a, 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 a um, kind of a collaborative approach, you know, with government, non-government uh, participants. Um, and the question is, what's the current federal agency view on spectrum leasing? Uh, is the is this a potential viable option for agencies to make additional capacity available for non-federal use? Greg, you want to try that one? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so the the conversation surrounding spectrum leasing has been around for a while, and uh, folks on the Hill has been pushing for that, and also um, NTIA within the federal government. That's an area that's very challenging for the department. Um, that's one of the um, items within the RFI, because I know there's a lot of options out there for spectrum leasing, and we've heard it from um, everything that you could think of. So I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm not sure how to do it and what's the best approach to do it, which is the intent of the RFI, because we wanna hear from some of the smart people out there, um, you know, kind of compile that things. One of the things we're gonna do with the RFI is once we get those inputs, we're gonna put them in the public so that you can all see what kind of inputs we got in because we wanna be able to have that open, transparent collaboration with industry and the inner agency to start moving this ball forward. But spectrum leasing can be cut in many different ways and um, slice many different directions. We're just not sure what's the best way to do it. And again, we're looking for industry to help us and the inner agency to help us kind of give us a, um, a smorgasbord of opportunities and options out there that we can look at. And then we'll come back and we'll say, okay, here's the ones that we think are um, conducive to DOD and the federal government working with NTIA. Over. Mm, smorgasbord, I'm getting hungry. Uh, uh, anybody else on leasing? Yeah, Peter, can I add to that? 
Sure, Vic. This, this gets into funding and authority as, as well. I mean, federal government, we don't own any spectrum, right? We just are authorized to use spectrum, which NTA manages. So if we were full owners, yeah, we can get into a situation where we can sublease and then that puts our model into the return of invest return on investment model, which we don't. That's on the commercial side. So yeah, there's legislation, there's authority, but today uh, we can't make any agreements where uh, we can sublease or uh, generate revenue that comes into the federal side because then that, for whatever reason, violates our appropriations, et cetera. So there's all kind of nuances in terms of the playing fields being a little different on the federal side versus the private side. And today we just can't go out and say, hey, we're using that spectrum 60% of utilization, let's sublease 40%, and therefore that can offset our budget. We know that probably will get sweep right off of our budget from the from the top. So there's lots of nuances in terms of funding, appropriations, and the authority you give us to use federal spectrum. That's it. And that kind of feeds into a, another question, and Kate, I'll address this to you, because um, if you want to address the leasing authority issue, because it also asks about the question is, the uh, does the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act framework need to be updated? What changes should Congress explore to advance agency's ability to share spectrum. Um, and I would say that would be the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act. It was, and it was recently revised by the Spectrum Pipeline Act to, uh, to fund R&D projects by, by agencies. Any thoughts on uh, CS, CSEA or the Pipeline Act or, or even leasing? Sure, you know, I think that um, we talked a lot about the SRF and the need for funding and accessing that funding for research. Um, you know, 3450 to 3550 is gonna be a great auction in terms of the proceeds that come in so that, you know, money can hopefully replenish the SRF. Uh, I think it ultimately boils down to funding, which is always a big issue, but I see, I've see i seen a lot of the work that the agencies have done to, to do this. But something to keep in mind, whether we're talking about leasing or research, is that technology is always changing. And I know right now we're talking about 5G and actually, and actually this goes back to the question you asked me about the, um, the management structure, but we're, right now we're talking about 5G and wanting to make sure that we're deploying these services and you know, it brings the next generation of technology. But once 5G is out there, there's gonna be a 6G, a 7G and beyond. And so a lot of these policy decisions as we're having these conversations, it's changing. A couple of years ago, if we mentioned sharing, it was, you know, the end of the world because clearing is definitely the the gold standard, and clearing still is the gold standard. But it's getting a lot more difficult to find large swaths of valuable valuable spectrum. Um, you know, industry has done a great job with using different frequencies to provide services. I know a few years ago we uh, there was millimeter wave was the biggest new trend. And the FCC did several auctions uh, under this administration to get millimeter wave out to the market. And now we're right back to mid-band spectrum. So I think that as we're talking about this, uh, I guess that was kind of a roundabout way of saying probably, there probably does need to be a revision. Um, but these conversations are continuing, are ongoing, and they will be for, you know, the duration of time. Probably. It's been <laughs> going on for about 100 years, so I'll be... Probably will keep on going. Uh, the next audience question, uh, I'll maybe uh, see if Eric wants to try to tackle this because it potentially relates to the, his kind of unique experience in kind of shepherding the AMBIT process and trying to balance the interests of incumbents and new entrants. And the question really is, it, is about in sharing spectrum, do you see that this creates dependencies between the incumbent and the new user uh, to ensure that changes on one side does not impact the other side. Um, if dependencies are created, how should we handle change by the various parties? Five, if 5G isn't forever, 6G is just maybe just around the corner. How do you deal with those, balancing those, those interests? That's actually a great question. Uh, and it highlights something that is, I would offer not different like it never happened before, but something that we don't often see is the approach of uh, DOD on this was not the traditional either, you know, we're here and you figure out how to work around us. That's kind of the CBRS model uh, or the other model, which we're seeing in some other bands of, 
you know, we don't really need that system or we can move it so we'll vacate. This time the approach really was how can we cooperate with industry? And it was, it was kind of an aha moment when we all realized that instead of having hard and fast worst case rules, if we could do a more cooperative planning for how industry would uh, uh, deploy their systems, that uh, in fact, maybe both could operate, you know, true sharing, uh, be transparent to each other for the most part, but do it carefully because especially when we're talking high powered radars, really bad things can happen to commercial systems that aren't protected. But since we know the radars are there, we know that DOD is going to use them. If you just know about it up front, you can uh, take those precautions. And so you see that moving forward that uh, once you have that relationship going, uh, when 6G comes out or a new radar system comes out or a new use case comes out, they can collaboratively come up with a solution as opposed to uh, literally decades long process of identification, rule making, uh, hemming and hawing, budget requests and all of that process. Uh, I uh, appreciate that perspective. I, I think I I couldn't agree more. Um, it's and it's maybe only going to get more important to collaborate, you know, uh, in the future, and not just you know at this you know early stages of, but uh, throughout the whole you know spectrum access process, even clearly into the, um, you know the the use as as uh, new systems are being deployed um, and upgraded, you know, uh, on both sides. So that's a great perspective. We're getting a lot of great questions coming in. I can't, I can't ask them all, especially the ones that might um, uh, be uh, uh, inappropriate or that are just too long because I can't, I don't have that time to read it. But um, uh, let me uh, tee up a, a kind of a weedy question about the data. You know, how do we, how do we make sure that the data um is is not only available you know like in real possibly real time you know and where, whether it's the incumbent or the new user in a system but but it's ac it's accurate um and um um and and, and, and can help truly help uh, facilitate sharing whether it's a SaaS like system or 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 the incumbent informed system like uh, charles was talking about uh had, you guys have been around a while, Fred and Vic, you know, and probably have to deal with these data issues, whether it's the DOD or NASA. How do you, how do you do that either internally to make it, uh, make it better, or, or, uh, um, you know, across across platforms? Fred, you want to try that one? Sure, I'll take that one, and um, I wouldn't mind coming back to the question you asked uh, Eric earlier, um, but okay. We'll, but, but let me take this one first. Uh, so data, uh, we see data as kind of a, um, kind of the lifeblood of automation, right? And in my opening remarks, I talked about the lack of um, our, our outdated uh, automation capabilities right. uh, within, within the federal government. We need to improve those. Data is the lifeblood of that. We need to improve on the data. We need to have data standards across the government and across the interagency, across uh, industry. Because that the accuracy of that data is going to drive the the accuracy of the models. If the data is not right and and the, and the data is not authentic, and and um and trusted, then then the models are nothing. Uh, that's one piece. Uh, we within DoD are on that track already. Uh, within uh, working with DISA on something called the Joint Spectrum Data Repository, where we're getting after that. Um, we have a data strategy coming out within the department. It gets after, just after what you're talking about, getting the data right, developing standards, um, making sure that data is authentic, authentic and exactly what it's supposed to be. The other piece of that is we have to get to modeling and simulation standardization. We spend too much time debating within the federal government and then the, within the industry on the different modeling and simulations that we're all using and coming in with different results. We gotta find a way to standardize those and we're really trying to get after the speed to need and decision as it relates to, um, you know, beating our competitors to 5G and the next G and beyond. We have got to speed up these decisions. Part of that is the data 
standardized modeling and simulation capabilities, a modernized spectrum IT architecture and infrastructure that will speed up a lot of these repurposing decisions that we're taking years and years to come to decisions on, and that's causing us to delay these decisions and, and, there's, and we're being outpaced by our, by our um, competitors. Uh, so that's where we're at on that. Thank you. Okay, and you want to try to, uh, the question on dependencies? Uh, it was kind of the incumbent and, and new entrant dependencies on each other. Did you ever wanted to respond to that one? Well, I mean, I think that goes, I think that, go ahead, somebody. No, again, I think, I think that's important in, uh, in the same regards. I mean, the authentic, the authentic, authenticity of the data is, is paramount. Uh, to to all of these kind of capabilities. So if that data is not accurate and precise and exactly what it's supposed to be, then it's, it's then it's not going to be true to to that kind of um, you know to what you're talking about there. So that the importance of that data and the dependency on that data is key uh, is key to moving forward. Um, it, but it's more than just the data. It's really having standards. What are the standards that we're building this data to? You know, I see us within the federal government on a case-by-case -case basis developing different things, whether it's modeling and simulation, coming up with different data, um, you know, different data for different uh, sharing regimes. We really have to come up with some kind of standardization across the board. Um, and that, I think that'll help with the speed of decisions and, uh, and help us better with interoperability as well. Great, thanks. Uh, and uh, thanks for reminding me about the automation question, because I did want to address that question too. And about kind of how the FCC and NTIA would should be advancing um, in terms of improving um, spectrum management automation tools. You mentioned a few that DOD has, um, um, but we're looking at federal and non-federal um, sides. Um, there's some pending legislation involving that, uh, that that might shed some light on, on that. Uh, but uh, I don't know, Vic or Kate, do you have any thoughts on the some of those automation debates, including uh, you know, how do we improve the data component? With Vic? Yeah, I didn't know how to do my hand raise on this WebEx. We can do it back in my office. So, but okay. yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, Fred. Um, I just want to add to what Fred is saying and not make it complicated, but just keep it very simple. And that was took up a lot of resources, a lot of senior resources this last cycle. And I think it's because we don't have best practices across the board. We don't have best practices, again, with um, the assumptions, the, the data, the, the rules, the deployment scenarios going into a model. We can all use the same model. We're going to come up with a different answer because we don't have best practices. Um, I hate to say it has to come from the regulators. It has to come from NTIA and FCC down to the users because if we on the federal side as users are marching to one uh, one script and industry is marching to another script and then it comes to a head at the regulators, um, that chews up a lot of time. And that's just to get us back to square one. And if we start at step one or square one on the same page, it sure makes the job a lot easier because the math is not that hard. We have some smart people doing analysis all around. But different data going in, different data come going out. And then it's a policy call as to what data you should have put in the, the model in the first place. So I just think right at the very top is so to have common best practices across the board. I think it makes a lot of our jobs a lot easier. Thanks. Kate? Sure, I'll respond. So we, uh, part of the reason that we introduced the Spectrum IT Modernization Act, both in the House and Senate, was after having many conversations with uh, Fred and Vic and a bunch of different um, spectrum or agencies, I guess, that use the spectrum. But something that I just want to emphasize that Vic said, and part of the reason for this legislation, is that it really does have to be done by NTIA for federal uh, agencies to all use across the board. And that's really the only way that I think we're going to make um, good advances in spectrum management is by making sure that these tools are standardized and it's not uh, individual agencies working in silos. So, you know, hopefully that bill will become mm -hmm. law and hopefully NTIA will uh, move swiftly to, to develop those practices. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, thank, and uh, we'll hopefully we'll be seeing the language enacted as part of the NDAA. Um, which would include, you know, modernizing um, across the board 
you know, the federal systems. And, and thanks for pointing out the uh, other agencies that uh, I, I chair, the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee, the IRAC, and we, uh, uh, Commissioner, Ross, I mean, uh, Secretary Ross mentioned that. Um, the IRAC has been around almost 100 years um, and uh, has uh, 19 federal agencies on it. Uh, and uh, all each and every one of those agencies is very dependent on on, on spectrum, um, and we plan to have those uh, those a lot of those agencies represented in future symposia. Uh, we're going to do a, a quick, maybe a lightning round of questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, maybe we'll give everybody a chance to do kind of like they do been doing at the congressional hearings lately with a yes or no question. I'll start off with maybe the first one. Um, uh, because I think I'm the only one who maybe knows the answer to it, is uh, uh, any plans to modernize GMF, which is the government master file, to create greater compatibility with modern data systems? The answer is yes. Yeah. Okay, here's another question I'm going to answer um, yes to. Does the federal, non-federal division in spectrum use impede or help spectrum sharing? Yes. Any uh, response, any disagreement with those those answers? <laughs> okay, hearing none. Uh, the, um, the, um, uh, uh, we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear, we've got a question about commercial users. They're gonna be on the next panel. So stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, and you'll be able to pose questions on commercial use. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, is uh, we're, I, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the Iraq. I mentioned that we're coming up on um, the 100th anniversary of the 1927 Radio Act, which started this all. Um, I'm kind of a history uh, buff. Some would call me amateurish, uh, you know, about it. Not an amateur historian, but uh, but my, kind of the, for this part of the lightning round, you you see any in the next. You know, before we get to, to 2027, do you see any real uh, changes uh, coming about, you know, in, in how spectrum management and spectrum policy is conducted in, in the U.S.? And we'll just go around, uh, start, start with uh, Eric, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, there are a lot of proposals out there, and we really appreciated the CSMAC looking into it. And... Uh, as Fred said, with like uh, the RFI, you know, there are a lot of good ideas out there that we're looking forward to, you know, seeing what we can do with it. Fred? Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think that um, the answer is yes. Um, we believe, we truly believe that spectrum sharing is going to be the new norm. You know, more spectrum sharing is going to be the new norm. And, and Eric said something very profound when he, when he gave his opening remarks that I think is key. And we believe that that collaboration is key across the government, across the interagency, um, um, academia, and so on and so forth. One of the keys to our success, as Eric kind of mentioned already, and, it, and I don't think it was, you know, I'm, I'm here foot stomping on this one here. You have to set the guidelines and, the, and this North Star that you're working towards before you enter into these conversations. You just can't walk in there with a, with a whiteboard and, and allow, you know, the, uh, this partnership and collaboration to be the Picasso and start drawing on the, on the board. And, you know, it'll be all kind of colors and you won't even be able to understand, you know, what's on the board. So setting that North Star is going to be very important. And I think that was one of the major reasons why that AMBIT approach was successful. We had clear guidance and guidelines and clear direction that we were working forward on. And I think that allowed us, um, you know, to leverage some of the stuff we did in the past that helped us in this regard. But setting that North Star is going to be key to every time we enter into these kind of um, uh, spectrum sharing conversations uh, for the first, that's my first part. The last part of this is the future. Um, and, and somebody asked a question about how does future stuff play into this in my own words. But I think the group that works into and works towards the solutions can set the future tone so that future entrance into that spectrum area and that spectrum arena that you just worked up that collaboration or that partnership way forward and understand that the future environment, this is what kind of future environment that that new entrant is expected to operate in so that they can invest in that kind of capability. So there's nothing new and there's no surprises. This is the environment that you're expected to operate in. You set that tone for the future. You set your North Star in the beginning and you set that tone in the future. So future entrants will know what kind of environment they have to develop to be able to operate in that kind of environment. Over. 
Hopefully that was clear. Crystal, anybody else? Is there is there any uh, uh, reason to be optimistic? Let me just echo you if I may. Um, we're already moving out on some uh, advanced technologies, which obviously is going to change the way we're going to have to do spectrum sharing. But it's uh, it's a means to share the spectrum better as well. I mean, we're looking at some wideband technologies, radios that can use the entire KA band, uh, which obviously there's a multitude of allocations within there. So we'll have to figure that out. But the te but the technology will be capable of using that entire, say, 20 to 30. Uh, gigahertz bandwidth. Uh, we're looking at software-defined radios, uh, which is which is nothing new, but clearly that gives you some uh, spectrum efficiency in terms of the, the the radio being able to use it more effectively. Uh, we're also looking at um, uh, cognitive cognitive systems, smart systems that can see what's out there, adjust on the fly, uh, notwithstanding any of the regulatory restrictions. But those are some of the technologies that we're looking at uh, in NASA and some of our partner agencies. And to go even further, we're even looking at internet uh, in space, where we're using missions, space vehicles as a node. So you don't have to go point to point from point A to point B. You can go to point C through point B, et cetera, et cetera. And those are some of the protocols that we're looking at and testing and developing and uh, uh, some soon to go operational in NASA. Um, but I also want to note too, that we're not just being, lack of better terms, passive because of some of the challenges uh, we had last cycle, we are pushing the science community to set up forums. Uh, we're working with National Academy, Committee of Radio Frequencies to pull in the active, the commercial, the broadband industry. So let's have a open discussion. We have a meeting coming up, uh, a course meeting coming up October 15, 16. We've asked them to invite commercial broadband because those are the smart people that need to figure it out in the room, not kind of duke it out and let's meet up at the highest level. These are the smart people, the technologies are evolving. And those are the communities that are gonna have to share for us to collectively uh, move forward, so. And I know I know that we're running out of time, but just to add really quickly to the policy question about whether policy will change by 2027, I think hands down, there's no question it has to. Um, communications 10 years ago was is, was completely different than the communications landscape now. Um, and I imagine 10 years from now, it's gonna be vastly different than what we're experiencing. So I, I think that there's just no question that that will have to change. So with that, I'm, I'll give it back. Thank you all. And thank you. I'll give a, one opportunity for uh, any parting words. Hearing none, I'll just say, please, please, everybody, please join me virtually in thanking our panelists for a wonderful discussion this morning live on WebEx. And now I turn it back to uh, our master's ceremonies, Dr. Charles Cooper. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tenhula for, for that. And uh, that was a fantastic panel. Th thank you to Peter and all of our panelists. Heard, heard quite a few themes on the technology side of it. Uh, one fascinating part to me was the harmonization of the standards for uh, the, to, to more readily access the spectrum sharing um, and also highlighting that it is uh, uh, that, that provision, the IT Modernization Act, is wrapped up in both the House and Senate versions of the NDAA. Uh, so we're hopeful that will pass. And also as a kind of a call out to the appropriators, you know, there, you know, for us to, for NDAA to actually bolt this together and put it together, it will require funding uh, that was uh, submitted in the president's uh, FY21 uh, budget. So, so support of that, I think, will help will help move the needle in in making this a more routine and and quicker access to 5G spectrum. While importantly, in a co-primary of uh, protecting the federal agency's mission. Uh, so, with that said, we're going to take a, a brief intermission, a virtual intermission here, to prepare for our second panel. Uh, it will be moderated by uh, NTA's own Derek Copeland, and we'll focus on the industry side. So we'll take a five minute break to gather those speakers and moderator for the second panel discussion. And that will also be a time for Q&A with those um, uh, industry panelists. So thank you. Hello and welcome back everyone. We're ready to start our next panel. Derek Copeland, NTA Senior Policy Advisor for Spectrum Policy is gonna moderate this panel discussion with key industries on what they really need for spectrum access and how they would like to see it come from us, the government, to respond in the form of policies and actions. So Derek has assembled a really good panel for us today, representing a cross-section of industries and companies that have been key players and partners 
in the process of developing and implementing spectrum policy and regulations. So as with the last panel, you may submit questions for Derek to pose um, during the panelists there in the discussions. If you are viewing this in the full screen mode, if you go off a of full screen, you will see the pop-up uh, 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 window uh, appear so you can then input your questions. So I'll pass it off to Derek to introduce the panelist. Take it away, Derek. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate the handoff. Uh, as Charles indicated, I'm Derek Klopin, uh, Senior Advisor in NTI's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Communication and Information here at the Department of Commerce. Absolutely thrilled to be moderating this panel. I want to thank the panelists uh, that I will introduce in a moment for joining us today for our Spectrum Symposium 2020 version. Thus far today, we've heard a lot from government policymakers and Spectrum users. Now it's time to hear from the private sector, from representatives of our technology industries that are driving innovation and economic activity across so many areas. Our industries continue to respond to the ever-increasing demand for more connectivity, more digital tools to drive business and consumer markets alike. So let me introduce the panel here in, in alphabetical order. And you know, while I'm, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I need to tell folks this tuning in, I'll do it anyway. This is a seriously strong group with a lot of experience and, and very, very savvy. Uh, so it's gonna be a lot of fun. And NTI is really thrilled to have you with us today. Our, our first panelist is Mary Brown. Mary is Senior Director of Government Affairs in Cisco's Washington DC Government Affairs Office. Mary leads Cisco's global, global public policy agenda for wireless technologies and spectrum policy. She is currently a member of the Department of Commerce, Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, the CSMAC, which advises NTA on spectrum policy matters. And thank you, Mary, very much for your ongoing service on CSMAC. During her career, she's worked as a consultant, in-house regulatory counsel for a major carrier, and for approximately a decade as a staff attorney and manager at the, at the FCC. Uh, next, we have Steve Sharkey. Steve is Vice President for Government Affairs, Technology, and Engineering Policy for T-Mobile. Steve has overall responsibility for T-Mobile's technical policy agenda, including ensuring that T-Mobile has access to sufficient spectrum as it deploys the next generation of broadband services. Steve is also a member of the CSMAC, and thank you, Steve, for your service on that, on that important body, the NTIA. Next is Jennifer Warren. As Vice President of Technology Policy and Regulation at Lockheed Martin, Jennifer is responsible for leading the development and implementation of corporate, domestic, and international regulatory initiatives affecting the company. Her portfolio includes spectrum, unmanned aerial systems, commercial space and launch, cyber privacy, and emerging technologies. She sits on three federal advisory committees, including, once again, the CSMAC, which uh, she currently co-chairs. Thank you, Jennifer, for your service. Prior to Lockheed Martin, she served in several senior roles at the FCC for the Commission of the European Union, both in Brussels and in Washington. She's an adjunct professor at Georgetown U University Law Center, teaching a course on what else but international telecommunications policy. And last but not least, we have Dave Wright. Dave is the head of Spectrum Policy and Standards at Comscope, where he focuses on Spectrum Policy and Standards initiatives. He's also president of the CBRS Alliance, where he played a founding an organizing role in the multi-stakeholder industry organization created to develop and promote LTE and now 5G new radio solutions for the 3.5 gigahertz CBRS band. So again, thank you all of you. I appreciate you being here again today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Let's get going. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a question, a couple of questions for everybody. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer. And I thought I'd kick it off in lieu of sort of opening statements, which one which you could sort of turn into that if you want which is a little bit of a why are you here question. And, and I literally mean this literally, why are you here? Because I, I, apparently you thought it was important enough to join us, so we appreciate that. So why is the use of spectrum important to your company, to the industry more broadly, to your industry, to our economy? You know, what are some of the current and emerging applications the use of spectrum enables that you see driving demand? You know, what are the impacts of decisions made by spectrum regulators, policymakers and the national global level. And I, I think we'll just stick with the alphabetical order for now. And, you know, so Mary, if you want to, you want to jump in first. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Derek. And thank you for having me today. It's been a fascinating discussion so far. So um, Cisco is a $49 billion uh, provider of IP based solutions uh, for enterprise and service provider. 
And for some time, uh, enterprise uh, customers have demanded wireless as part of the suite of technologies that they use, that they deploy in order to be in business. So this isn't just the convenience of having your Wi-Fi internet access uh, anywhere in your office uh, with a Wi-Fi uh, network, although that's a that's a big use in the enterprise sector. But it's also part of how businesses conduct their operations, and this includes government as well, any kind of enterprise, public or private. So their output is increasingly dependent upon wireless technologies. Uh, and that includes Wi-Fi, it includes 5G, it includes any number of uh, any number of wireless technologies that are available in the marketplace today. So um, let's just pull back for a minute and look at what's happening broadly in the market. Um, Cisco's most recent uh, internet report uh, released earlier in the year shows that by 2020, going to have in the U.S. 4.6 billion networked devices. 4.6 billion. That's up from 2.7 billion in 2018. That's a lot of devices that are going to be connecting to these networks. Um, we can slice that data in different ways. About 31% of that 4.6 billion will be deployed in enterprise locations. And the other 69% uh, will be consumer. Enterprise, by the way, slightly growing in share over time as enterprises become more and more digitized. A different way to slice that 4.6, about 25% of those devices will be mobile connected. So that means they will be able to access uh, mobile network operators, network service provider networks, those devices tend also to be Wi-Fi enabled as well. So they have two ways of accessing uh, very different networks. About 75% of the devices will either be Wi-Fi only or wired to the network. Wired is decreasing as a share in importance of, of devices. And, uh, and in light of the conversation so far of that, that has focused so much on 5G, I thought it was interesting to, to ask the question, of that 4.6 billion, how many devices will actually be 5G devices? Well, it turns out by 2023, just 4.4% will be 5 or about just a little over 200 million we're projecting. So as much of, as, as there is talk of 5G, it takes a long time for, for commercial sectors to migrate from existing technology to new technology, and we're seeing evidence of that in the numbers. That's not to discount the importance of 5G, but just to say there's a, there's a long transition here as we move from one generation to the next generation. Now to get back to the, to the enterprise point for a minute, um, enterprises are quite agnostic on technology. <laughs> They just want something that's going to get the job done. Whatever their job is, whatever the problem is they want to solve, they don't have religion about uh, what technology they, they use. The key for them is how can wireless improve my output? How can it make me more efficient? This is, in fact, the very first question that uh, is in the Pentagon DISA request for information that came out last week. How can I deploy 5G in my own network to be more efficient and to do the job better than what I'm doing now? It's the same, it's the same call for help that we're hearing from all of our, all of our enterprises, enterprise users about how can we deploy wireless. And, and this is true whether uh, wireless is being deployed to move a good that is not itself digitized, such as in a mining situation where wireless is increasingly being used in mine operations to move ore and other materials, or port situations where, the, uh, where wireless networks are extensively deployed 
to make port operations more efficient, uh, food, the food industry on farms, et cetera, or the good itself is digitized, right? So here we hear from the auto manufacturers about their auto plants and how, to, how they can make uh, the production of vehicles that themselves are increasingly becoming computerized uh, more efficient. So there's a lot of different uh, problems, a lot of different networks, a lot of different technologies, but the one thing is clear is spectrum policy is key to making sure that all of those demands and interests can be met. If spectrum is available, if services are available, if Wi-Fi is available, if other spectrum is available, then enterprises can make a rational choice about how they, uh, how they can meet their needs. Um, I will also say that uh, after hearing the, the previous panel, I would associate um, uh, my remarks with the views of Mr. Moorfield that increasingly spectrum sharing is going to be the norm for how we do that, particularly in the enterprise space. Um, so we have the example of CBRS uh, where, uh, where spectrum is shared uh, with the Navy priority licenses and then generally authorized users. Uh, we have now the example of uh, the six gigahertz band where Wi-Fi will share with a range of uh, users that have priority uh, uh, for the band and are licensed for the band uh, in order to achieve that. So we do believe and, and do agree that spectrum sharing uh, is going to be the new norm. So with that, uh, Derek, those are my opening remarks. I'll turn it back to you. Great. No, I appreciate it, Mary. That, that was terrific. Um, Steve, I'll, I'll send it over to you. Uh, great. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, and thank you for having me here. This has been a fascinating panel uh, so far and a fascinating event. Um, also, just on the importance of spectrum. So uh, I'm, I work for T-Mobile, and as a mobile carrier, that is really the lifeblood of, of our industry. Right, it is the core of what we do and deploy uh, to provide services to uh, you know to our customers, and um, those there are, are immense changes going on there. Uh, we're always uh, working to try and keep up with uh, with a growing demand. Last year um, we had about thirty percent growth year over year growth in uh, in data uh, in data services or data uh, demand, and this year we saw. A big shift around um, the COVID-19, right? With um, people having to work at home, we saw a large increase in demand as a result of that that we don't see going away particularly soon. And one of the interesting things was it was also a shift in where we see that demand. So where we've got networks that were built to really concentrate in more urban areas and provide a lot of capacity there, we saw a shift in demand into um, more suburban or rural areas as people were working from home. You know, using video conferences like this to, uh, to meet um, and frankly moving from what used to be a conference call to video calls for, uh, for doing business. Students working at home now. And while, you know, we'll get through this, we we think that uh, that shift in demand is is uh, you know is going to be more permanent, um, and we do need spectrum um, for that. We are uh, there's a lot of talk about 5G. We're certainly uh, deploying 5G services um, uh, very quickly now. I'll say it took a little bit longer than we thought to get started on that. Um, we just recently, well, in April, uh, finished a merger with Sprint, which it, Gave us access to uh, to mid-band spectrum that we didn't have before. That's really allowed us to, to start intensifying our network and uh, boosting the kinds of speeds that uh, that we'll get with our kind of layer cake spectrum approach of a um, low-band base layer in our 600 megahertz spectrum, 2.5 gigahertz as a primary uh, mid-band layer, and then millimeter wave for you know really fast speeds, but, you know, getting access to that spectrum um, and having that um, uh, the right amount of spectrum to meet a variety of needs and provide both coverage and capacity um, is, is hugely important. 
And I think we've seen, you know, that's uh, the industry has been um, incredibly good at and competitive at working to get these systems out there. And we've got, you know, all the carriers are now deploying 5G and um, uh, with varying um, spectrum positions, it's, you know, it's varied a little bit. And it's really good to see the FCC being able to move forward on some uh, with C band spectrum auction, uh, the 3450 and 3500 um, uh, spectrum being made available because those are really going to be keys to filling out a lot of these uh, spectrum portfolios. Um, and, you know, we're seeing demand um, in different areas as well, and whether or not it's going to be, um, uh, you know, self-driving cars or drones, we're looking at uh, meeting a variety of, of applications there. Uh, I do, I'll, I'll talk some on the, you know, the spectrum sharing that, um, uh, you know, that there's it was so much talk about in the, um, in the first panel. And we certainly, there's no doubt that spectrum sharing is going to be uh, more and more part of what we do and how we access spectrum. And we've made a lot of advancements in that. CBRS is a great example, right, where that's a, you know, very dynamic environment there. But I think as we look at, um, and Kate actually said it well, you know, we would do um, exclusive access is still the gold standard here. And key to it, whether it's shared or exclusive access, is really that the certainty of getting access to that spectrum and with parameters that are that enable us to provide the services that we need to provide um, and to do that efficiently. Uh, you know, well, CBRS is a great um, step forward in sharing. There's also severe uh, power limitations that from a carrier perspective make it look much more like uh, an unlicensed band from an integration into the, uh, into the net um, point of view as opposed to full power wide area mobile uh, mobile license spectrum so i think we need to keep in mind that you know the need to provide uh you know spectrum that there's certainty to access so that you've got reliable services um, and it can be used efficiently we just did a um we recently had a demonstration where we were able to take 100 megahertz of 2.5 gigahertz spectrum and um with steerable arrays use that the same spectrum in a sector simultaneously to serve eight different off-the-shelf um, devices at about 700 megabits per second per device. So you saw uh, spectrum efficiency of about 50, um, 50 bits per hertz, which is you know unprecedented for what we've traditionally seen for, for spectrum efficiency. And you know having exclusive access to that and being able to manage it effectively ourselves is key to driving efficiencies and to provide those, those kinds of services. Um, and I'll say it's not just, you know, services to mobile customers, but it's also driving greater competition um, as our spectrum portfolio expands. We're able to enter uh, new markets like, um, uh, you know, fixed wireless to the home to provide competition to um, cable companies and others. And they're looking at, at competition to, to us as well. It all drives down prices um, and is better for the consumer, and um, you know drives certainly the, a lot of uh, innovation and the ecosystem in the US. So and with that, I'll turn turn it back over to you, right there. Thank you, Steve. No, I appreciate that, and certainly a lot to un unpack there in this in this balance between you know exclusive access and shared and. Uh, uh, you know, it, it seems, I think our perspective is always sort of more all of the above and, and you know, each band company come at it differently, uh, you know, based on what's happening here. So Jennifer, I will, I will turn to you next. Hi, right, thank you. And good morning, everyone. And, and thanks for including Lockheed Martin and Aerospace writ large um, in this group. Um, just to kind of introduce Lockheed, for those who aren't familiar, we're a global security and aerospace company. So obviously a little different than who Mary and Steve represent, but I was struck by some of the commonality in why we're here because of the spectrum demands um, of our customers, right? So for us, uh, the technology solutions that we develop, that we R and D and manufacture here in the United States, like the larger U.S. aerospace and defense industry, are driven by demands 
um, across multiple sectors, though, so both civil, commercial, and um, defense, and across a lot of different domains, to use a, a defense word, but it's appropriate. Um, when you think of aerospace and defense, you think of planes, helicopters, UAVs, you can think of um, satellites in space, so inter interplanetary missions, deep space science, um, LEO constellations, navigation and timing systems, weather satellites, radars. The, the, the ecosystem of aerospace and defense is, is large, um, and almost by definition, very little of it is wired uniquely. Um, the platforms are spectrum dependent. The capabilities that are loaded on the platforms um, are spectrum dependent. So the U.S. aerospace and defense industry is very, um, very dependent on what the regulators do, the policy making, both domestically and internationally. And I bring up um, domestically and internationally because um, the export market which we really haven't talked about here, is so significant for aerospace and defense. So while domestically we have about 2.2 million employees writ large, um, and we have, um, I think it's just like 2019, 360, $396 billion contribution to the GDP, our exports alone are $148 billion. So it's a significant contributor. And so we have a particularly strong interest also in international harmonization of spectrum and standards because we have those economies of scale, those dependencies, not only from uh, the collaboration among our customer sets, but also for the what we call the techn technical readiness levels of um, U.S. technology. And just as you know, we're very proud of. Um, the U.S. leading and, and hopefully winning the race to 5G, we also want to make sure that we continue to lead on the technological innovation front in A&D. This is um, a very strong area for us writ large. And Lockheed Martin itself, um, last year we came to about $60 billion in sales. Um, and so fairly significant, 16,000 suppliers nationwide that are part of this aerospace and def uh, U.S. aerospace and defense for Lockheed. So we have a lot of staking in, in getting the spectrum policy um, right. I hope that kind of is, is clear. And I think the collaboration that is, is emerging among different sectors is really important and kind of speaks to the future of spectrum sharing. I'm going to give um, DOD some credit, some, some credit for having brought together really in a new way, um, some of the wireless OEM service providers, um, radar manufacturers, defense uh, manufacturers writ large, to get together and really s start talking about how do we start to share? How do we start to design to share? How do we architect to share? Um, a term I like to, to borrow from the privacy world uh, where they have privacy by design is sharing by design. How do we start when we move past legacy and look forward? What is the innovation that we can all bring into the beginning of our designs for next generation systems? Because we have demands across all these sex sectors for next generation of all the existing technologies, be they radar or wireless comms or satcom. I think um, to answer, Derek, your question about where do we see new, new demands as opposed to just next generation of existing capabilities, one, one area where Steve already touched upon briefly was unmanned. From our perspective, it's, it's you know much more than the small UAS world. It is uh, looking at urban air mobility, which can include everything from you know a thousand pizza boxes rather than one pizza box, to and passengers, and um, cargo planes, and firefighting helicopters, etc. There's a whole world of mobility, what I like to talk about is the next generation autonomy economy that is inherently spectrum dependent as well. But there's also some really cool concepts in aerial mesh networking that we see as um, a new demand for spectrum, as well as um, just the capability of spectrum sharing. Um, it's not clear that the evolution of spectrum sharing is going to mean less spectrum is, is necessary 
but how do you use it in a different way, right? That's all part of, of the conversation. So um, I think, you know, we're looking at um, solutions that domestically we can have leadership on, which I, I think, you know, we often talk about necessity being the mother of invention. And so I really applaud DOD for the leadership that it showed in the RFI and asking some of the tough questions that we all talk about on the on the margins in the hallways, well, when we work together in hallways of meetings. Um, but they kind of put it there and are going to have us all respond and and that can inform a lot of the policymakers that may have the more direct jurisdictional um, uh, oversight. But it's a it's a great start to really start to move the conversation forward um, in, a, in a meaningful way. But the domestic conversation we have, for the reasons I talked about before, really important internationally. Um, we have, as the A&D industry, we have customers globally for what we build. Our, we do the R&D and the manufacturing here. So our facilities here in the United States, making sure that those facilities are able to continue to support the R&D and manufacturing for customers globally is is really important as we move into the sharing world and that's something we're going to be making sure the policymakers focus on domestically um, again as, as we move forward in in um, whether it's in the radar bands satellite or otherwise it's an important area of attention um, so i'll stop there and um, look forward to the further discussion thank you great thank you appreciate it uh dave wright i'm going to turn it over to you now thanks Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek. And I also appreciate the opportunity for Comscoop and the CBS Alliance to participate today. I should say up front that um, most of my comments will be made on behalf of Comscoop. I, I certainly have some perspectives to share from the CBS Alliance experience, but I'm, I'm going to be representing Comscoop with my remarks today. Uh, it's always interesting kind of batting cleanup, um, and, and I'm not only doing that for our panel, but really for the whole event. Um, so lots of good points have been made both in the uh, the government panel and certainly by my fellow panelists here. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know much about Comscope, we are a leading U.S. manufacturer of next generation network solutions that includes both wired and wireless. On the wireless side, uh, we make solutions and products that utilize licensed spectrum, unlicensed spectrum, and shared spectrum. So, yeah, again, uh, in licensed spectrum bands, we do things such as uh, antenna systems, radio units, um, as well as both uh, uh, DAS and small cell in-building solutions, uh, would include all the active radio components as well as the management systems for, for those solutions. Um, uh, with shared spectrum, uh, as you may have uh, gotten the uh, impression already, we're a leading participant in the CBRS ecosystem um, manufacturing uh, RAN solutions, so small cell solutions for the CBRS band, as well as the Spectrum Access System, which is the uh, coordination database, the dynamic coordination database that CBRS utilizes, and the environmental sensing capability, which is the way that we um, detect and protect the, uh, the federal military radar operations that I think Mary alluded to earlier. So, um, and then an unlicensed, our Ruckus unit is one of the leading um, enterprise and carrier Wi-Fi suppliers, as well as our Aris unit for being one of the leading residential Wi-Fi providers. So um, Comscope occupies a unique position in really playing across you know, uh, virtually all types of spectrum access. I think Derek mentioned, you know, NTI doesn't really take a position on it. It's all good. We need um, different solutions for different problems. That is certainly uh, our perspective as well. So, you know, why am I here? I, I was wondering that myself. I, I'm not on CSMAC, so I didn't, you know, the, all the other panelists are. Fortunately, one of my colleagues, uh, Mark Gibson, is, so maybe that got me in the door. I'm not sure. Um, you know, why is Spectrum important to Comscope? Well, I was going to use the same line Steve did, uh, which is that um, Spectrum is the lifeblood uh, of everything that we do these days in the wireless realm. And uh, Mary made some good points earlier regarding the, you know, the Cisco forecast on connected devices a couple of years out, we're at 4.6 billion um, connected devices. So it's you know, it, incredibly clear um, that the world is increasingly wireless. And the only way that that increasingly wireless world is going to happen is if we have access to spectrum. 
So, you know, the work that NTIA does, the agencies do to, you know, look at what their needs are, figure out if there are opportunities for sharing or opportunities for relocating, and certainly combined with the work that the FCC does um, to then make Spectrum available for commercial uses is yeah, absolutely vital. Um, without that, our industry is, uh, is essentially um, going to be, you know, uh, more abundant and not able to move forward. So, you know, there's a lot of conversations and comments from, I think, Fred talking about the next G and then Kate uh, talking about 6G and 7G. And, uh, you know, and they're right. We do need to start thinking today about, you know, what the spectrum requirements are going to be for 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. Um, and we need to continue developing that pipeline. And I applaud, you know, NTIA, the Hill, uh, the Commission um, for continuing to, to look for bands um, where we can expand. And I know that's I'm kind of getting ahead of the question, so I'll stop there. But I look forward to those uh, portions of the conversation uh, about you know what we can do to move forward. Um, I think Secretary Ross and then also Steve mentioned just the uh, you know the last six months have been a pretty you know, vivid example of how dependent upon spectrum we all are and all wireless services we are. That's certainly been our finding at Comscope, and I think it also, again, illustrates how you know, it's not a matter of licensed or unlicensed um, or shared. It's really all of the above. Um, so you know, in the educational context, one of the things that we've done is provide um, Wi-Fi that goes onto school buses, which since they're not being used in a lot of cases now to collect schools, uh, pardon me, collect uh, students and bring them to schools, the districts are equipping them with Wi-Fi, taking them out into the community and parking them in you know, central locations near libraries and places like this where the students can then go get Wi-Fi access, complete their homework assignments, submit their assignments, et cetera, do research. Um, but uh, it, So the Wi-Fi obviously utilizes unlicensed spectrum, but it's almost always uh, tied to a 4G LTE backhaul solution, right? So you, you've got unlicensed and licensed working together um, in that scenario to meet the need. And, uh, and it's really, it, it's, you know, it's playing to the strengths of both of those spectrum types and the technologies to achieve the overall solution. Um, another example would be uh, Murray School Districts in, uh, in Utah, which is utilizing a CBRS shared spectrum um, solution to provide fixed wireless uh, access um, to some of their students who would not otherwise have any connectivity whatsoever. They just didn't have any good residential broadband. So they've deployed um, some CBRS uh, higher power category B, um, I guess, Steve, mid power, I'll call it, not, not high power, but uh, mid power uh, solutions. And they're able to, you know, go far beyond what they would have been able to go beyond uh, range wise with unlicensed spectrum. So those are just uh, a few examples of, um, you know, again, how access to spectrum is really making a difference in these challenging times. And um, I look forward to the conversations about, you know, uh, spectrum policy. It's absolutely critical that we get the spectrum policy right. Um, but it was interesting. The last question I think Charles posed was, you know, how, how will policy or will policy change going forward? Um, I, I think it has to. Um, and I um, yeah, appreciate CSMAC's work on, you know, the whole federal spectrum management process. There was a Senate hearing that uh, one of my colleagues participated in um, a couple months ago on that topic. I think there's some good thoughts on the table about, um, you know, course corrections or um, you know, modifications that we can make to the process. But I think it's absolutely critical that uh, we continue to make more spectrum available, uh, both for the federal needs, as, as Fred rightly pointed out, but also for commercial. Um, and then the final point I wanted to make was just to echo and reinforce what Jennifer said about the importance of international harmonization. Um, and I can't stress how strongly, you know, we feel that it's important that bands like the 3.1 to 4.2 gigahertz range, which are you know largely being harmonized globally for cellular 5G operations, LTE and 5G, um, or the six gigahertz band, which is uh, you know again uh, going to be globally harmonized as an unlicensed band. It's important that we have that um, consistency. So you know it's not just national policy; it's really international policy. Um, the WRCs, uh, all of that comes into play here. Because that's what enables the you know the scale of the ecosystems that creates the mass market economics to make these things really viable. Um, and uh, yeah, in a CBRS context, that's one of the reasons that we've got the vibrant ecosystem that we do. 
the amount of equipment that's become available is just because of the economics around the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz range being a you know globally harmonized LTE and now 5G band for you know the last call it decade. So um, thank you again. Look forward to the questions. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, that was a, a great a great foundation from from all of you, and I think we have a pretty good understanding now why you're all here. And certainly, uh, you know, you know, certainly, I think it's now time to think about maybe you know, let's how how are we doing? Let's look at a, maybe a scorecard approach. Uh, we've heard a lot today from other panelists on on you know, and, and keynotes on successes and collaboration that's taken place. My question for you all is, is how do you assess action that's you know been taken by this administration, by the FCC, by Congress in recent years? Are we on the right track? I think we'll wait, maybe have a next question on the future, but sort of just looking at where we where we sit today. And uh, maybe I'll reverse the order this time though. Dave, you just went. So maybe I'll skip over to Dave, go back to you, go go Jennifer and then Steve Marriott uh, or Jennifer and then go back to you, Dave, and then go to uh, that's it. That's all right. So Jennifer, you want to take it first? Okay, thank you for clarifying. I thought I was up, but I just wanted to make sure. So how, how's everyone doing? Um, I think that um, everyone is asking, all the entities that you mentioned are asking the hard questions. And that's the most important thing is, is asking the hard questions and helping to drive um, everyone into uh, maybe what, what, what will feel like uncomfortable places because we've enjoyed whether wireless, satellite, defense um, have all enjoyed where we've sat for a long time. Um, there hasn't been a lot of change in, in some ways, um, not systematic policy change, just more ad hoc. So what we're looking at now is really asking the tough questions about a systematic change in approaching spectrum policy. And um, I think that's, that's great. We, we need to do that. Um, I was very heartened by um, the comments that the secretary made and his three priorities and showing that US global leadership in all those domains, um, that was, that was a, a very important part. What I'd like to see incorporated into all of the dialogue though, as these hard questions are being asked, is um, the, a strategy, a national strategy that includes uh, the manufacturing industry. Um, as we want to grow and sustain U.S. jobs and capabilities, let's make sure and focus on um, not only how can, which we certainly support, 5G be implemented for enterprise solutions because um, we are a very large enterprise with, position, with uh, offices in all 50 states, so we look forward to that. But how can manufacturing sites that are doing the U.S. R&D be incorporated into this natural national strategy explicitly so that spectrum sharing solutions encompass um, the broad stakeholder community, not just the front end, um, shall we say, communication service providers um, or um, licensed users. Um, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, when you, when, when you um, look at it more broadly. Um, I think a lot of what we're hearing and seeing reflects the reality that um, the luxury of how we've been using spectrum is just that kind of a luxury. And um, in a decade, we may look back and say, oh, you know, that that was a, a time in place, how, how antiquated we were back then. I look forward to doing that from retirement, maybe. Um, but um, in all seriousness, um, I think we are moving to the right um, in the right direction with the questions that we're asking. We're always going to have quibbles and concerns with obviously certain elements of, of, of different decisions, no matter where they're taken, I'm sure, um, and no matter what seat we're, we're in, because unlike in the past, every decision has consequential impacts these days. Um, there's very little that's as, as stovepiped. Um, none of my customers have stovepiped access anymore. Um, and uh, so there are consequences, but my hope is that through the hard asking, we're getting to cross-sectoral collaboration uh, and can come up with solutions, um, particularly among the OEMs. Um, and maybe that will drive everybody else who are, you know, the buyers from the OEMs. But if, if the OE OEMs can come up with solutions, um, we're on a good path. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. 
Sure. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, Dave, I'll, I'll turn back to you and you kind of preview this a little bit. I'm, I'm sure you will say CVRS was one of the successes, but you know what? Looking at again the scorecard on, on you know what, what what's been happening. That's 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 good. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. And and yeah, I can't uh, <laughs> I can't not mention CBRS here, obviously. So yeah, the fact that um, industry and uh, NTI, DOD, the commission um, have all been working on operationalizing this and now commercial commercializing the band for um, yeah, call it six years uh, at this point. I think that there is so much that has been learned um, during that course of time. Um, yeah, certainly. Yeah, at the technical level, you know, um, you know what what specific mechanisms were put in place and how we determined protection criteria and you know how ESCs talk to SASs and all of this stuff. Uh, and that's all well and good. But what's far more important in my mind is the just the level of understanding that is developed between industry and um, and the federal agency in this case DoD about their different uses and their needs, right? Um, you know, the DOD's use of spectrum is dramatically different um, than commercial uses. That's just uh, the, the reality. They don't quantify things. Their ROI is not measured in dollars. Um, it, it's measured in operational effectiveness or, you know, potentially lives saved. Um, so, you know, just, I think, better understanding of those issues better understanding around the operational security needs that uh, DOD has in the CBRS context was really, really helpful. Um, and, you know, if I look back over the those six years, you know, I, I look at some of the, yeah, relatively thorny problems that came up later in the game, right? So stuff that surfaced, yeah, 12, 18 months ago, which, you know, when it first came up, we were all like, oh my goodness, this, this could be, a, you know, a, a significant obstacle. Um, to making CBRS successful. Um, but, you know, given the relationships that were in place at that point in time, the understanding that had developed, um, that spirit of real collaboration around problem solving, you know, people were able to roll up their sleeves, get in rooms together, and, uh, you know, and, and NTI played a, a huge role in this, right? The, the folks in OSM, potentially, uh, particularly Ed and Nick, uh, you know, we're neck deep in, in all of this. Um, and, you know, the final results were that, um, you know, those federal systems that needed to be protected are protected. And they did so in such a way as to really minimize the impacts of the commercial deployments. And so, you know, I just view that as a huge success. I really do. And I think as we talk about, and, and AWS3 was another example, just a different context around the sharing uh, framework. But um, you know, as we look to 3450 to 3550 and the implementation of the CPAs and PUAs, new acronyms I've got to remember, um, you know, it, it's going to require that same sense of real collaborative. Um, you know, we're in this together to make this uh, the best possible outcome for everyone. And I agree with Fred; it's not a zero-sum game. Um, you know, federal doesn't have to lose for commercial to win. It, it, truly can be a win-win. A that doesn't mean everybody's going to get everything that they want, but um, but we really do need to get in the, in the room together and look for the best uh, outcome for, for all entities. Um, so I'm excited about that. There's a lot to build on. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, how we're doing recently at a, at a, a, a I think, a governmental level, um, I would just observe that, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, spectrum policy, next generation wireless technologies are viewed as a national priority. Um, you know, when, when the FCC has an open RAND form and you've got Secretary Pompeo come and, and give an opening remark, um, you know, the comments that were made earlier from, uh, from Fred that, you know, uh, spectrum sharing is a national security imperative. Um, which I agree with, by the way, as we talk about, um, you know, opening, uh, especially more mid-band spectrum. I don't see how we're going to do that without sharing. And if we're going to share, we need to do it in such a way that we're not um, negatively impacting federal operations. So, uh, you know, I think it's clear that, um, again, these, these issues are viewed, known, and viewed as priorities at the highest level of government. And, and that's good, because they should be. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, Steve, uh, over to you. Good. Uh, thanks, Eric. The, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of good progress and a lot of good. We've had 
some great success filling a what was a pretty dry pipeline of spectrum for a while with uh, you know, 600 megahertz auction, a lot of millimeter wave being made available. Now we've got uh, C band, um, the 3.4, 3.5 gigahertz band um, uh, coming up. So a lot of progress there. Um, I, you know, I do think the process is still fundamentally difficult. And, you know, Dave had some good remarks on CBRS. I, that process took too long. You know, it takes too long on the front end of the difficult fights to get to a place where we get cooperation. And frankly, the same thing happened with AWS3, right? That was a long fought battle on the front end. And eventually we got to a place um, in, through CSMAC and part of the subcommittees there where it became a much more cooperative process. And, I, you know, I think what, what I've always found, um, and I think is consistent with what Dave talked about with CBRS, so once you get the experts and the engineers in the room to really talk and solve problems, that's where you get good cooperation and good success. Um, uh, and I think it was Fred that talked about that, you know, that all flows from a top-down directive and setting that North Star about what the direction needs to be uh, and giving the, you know, giving them the freedom to do that. Um, I think on the front end, we still see, you know, too often those battles being hard fought and in not a cooperative way. And, you know, we need to get to a, a place where uh, NTIA and the FCC are working um, uh, cooperatively, where there is a good structure for the spectrum management. You know, we do see agencies going around the process, whether to the Hill or, you know, or other, other sources um, uh, to uh, advocate for their views. So, uh, you know, I'll say there's, you know, it, it feels like we're always two steps forward and one step back. I thought, you know, with AWS 3 and the progress we made there and working together, you know, was excellent, but I felt like it rolled back um, pretty quickly after that. CBRS, you saw good progress, you know, once everybody got in a room. Um, but in other bands, we're, you know, we're seeing that roll back. So I don't feel like we're still in a place where there's kind of a commonality of, um, uh, you know, to get to a common objective. And we do have some work, some work to do there. So I was actually, um, uh, you know, some of the comments by Vic and Fred were very good about the need to work through some of these issues and get to some common tools and common understanding. Um, I too often where, uh, you know, we do argue a lot on the parameters going into the front end of the, uh, the sharing process and study. We need to make sure that we're looking at protecting, um, you know, at providing reasonable protection for real systems and not over protecting systems um, and that the parameters are accurate parameters and that, you know, is often a, that's, there's a lot of time spent on that, right? And difficulty getting to a agreement on that. Um, but it feels like there's, uh, you know, and I think the, part of the key there too is going to be having a strong NTIA and a strong FCC that can bring all the parties together in a way that is more collaborative. And, you know, and frankly, it is something that we've struggled with for many years. How do you get that uh, a more open dialogue at the front end of these processes? And I think a lot of the success that we've had recently is, you know, is because um, the administration has stepped in and given some top-down guidance of here's where we're going to go, and then the troops fall into place. But well, we need to see it more as, a, you know, both from the federal side and the commercial side uh, uh, to see it as more of a uh, path towards a combined success. But, I, you know, I mean, having said that, I think there's been a lot of good progress and a lot of good, um, a lot of good people looking at these issues and, you know, good intention to make this process work as well as possible. Thank you, Steve. Um, Mary, let's, uh, let's start to you. Okay, thanks, Derek. Um, I agree there's been a lot of great progress and I was, uh, I've been very encouraged watching uh, both the FCC and the executive branch and NTIA uh, moving on three gigahertz that those those challenges are daunting and and the sharing 
uh, mechanisms in CBRS very challenging, but uh, but I think I, I give high marks for everyone for really putting their nose to the grindstone and and making available you know 530 megahertz of spectrum in the mid band. That's uh, that's a fantastic achievement. Um, just a couple things in terms of how are we doing that I wanted to sort of tease out of the conversation. Some of this draws on on remarks Jennifer made earlier, which is uh, that we tend to we tend to overlook, and that is uh, the global impact of our domestic um, spectrum uh, decisions. Uh, and I'll use two examples. One is the recent six gigahertz decision by the FCC to open 1200 megahertz of spectrum to unlicensed use as an underlay underneath various microwave uses. Um, this wasn't just because uh, we need to watch more cat videos. <laughs> this was because we had an entirely new generation of technology, of Wi-Fi technology, that needed to access broader swaths of spectrum to really get the full advantage of the technology that had been designed. This is, you know, just as in the cellular world, we're broadening channelization uh, to increase efficiencies, so the same physics apply in the Wi-Fi world. And so this gives us a tremendous platform for innovation going forward. And that's important, not just for us, but because it's a bellwether for the for the globe, right? The other regulators immediately stand up and pay attention. We have uh, active proceedings going on in, in all the theaters of the world right now, looking at that proceeding. And that's important because, frankly, the Wi-Fi industry is primarily a US-based industry. While there are some 800 members of the Wi-Fi Alliance globally, the really important players and the ones that are designing the silicon and manufacturing most of the equipment, et cetera, et cetera, are U.S. based. And so, um, and so this U.S. based industry is the one that is supplying Wi-Fi globally. Uh, and uh, it's a tremendous um, accomplishment that the FCC was able to see their way through the, sh the very difficult sharing conversation uh, and rules that protect the incumbents while permitting um, this new innovation platform to happen. So that's sort of sort of one point. And then a different, slightly different perspective uh, on this is one where we're not doing so well. Uh, and this again harkens back to Jennifer's point about making sure manufacturing is part of our national spectrum strategy. And that is the question of enterprises. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my, my initial remarks. Enterprises do not have a technology religion. They do not care. Uh, they just want to solve problems. They want to solve their operational problems, their business process problems, whatever it is. And there is no one single answer that solves all those problems. So while service provider 5G spectrum will answer many concerns that enterprises have and address many concerns that enterprises have, it won't address all their problems. Nor will Wi-Fi as a commons spectrum, as a spectrum where any one of us can walk in with a, with a smartphone that has access to the same spectrum uh, and interrupt a business process in some way. That won't solve all their problems either. What we really need to focus on, uh, I think, from a commercial perspective, is some form of lightly licensed, locally licensed spectrum for enterprises. And this is something that when you look around the world, other countries that are manufacturing powerhouses are moving toward. Germany has a version at 3.7 gigahertz. Japan has a version, uh, I believe, at 28 gigahertz. Um, and other countries are looking at this also. And these are, these are solutions that just cry out for sharing, right? Because, uh, because they can be uh, inserted into spectrum that other people are using, that other entities are using, um, and, and only require a footprint uh, at the enterprise level, a geographic footprint at the enterprise level. Um, this enables enterprises to own and operate their own networks in a deterministic way. They can control the spectrum. 
These are the kinds of concerns that we need to start incorporating as we think about our national spectrum strategy. The conversation is just getting underway here in the U.S. in a serious way. It's a difficult conversation to have because enterprises typically don't play in spectrum policy, but I think it's one we, uh, we need to do, uh, we need to have uh, going forward. So I, I heartily second to Jennifer's idea of including those aspects uh, in spectrum policy going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mary, and I appreciate everyone's very thorough answers. Now, I, mean, I think some of you have crept a little into the, you know, where do we go next, what's next, but I think we'll, we'll come back to that, and I'll maybe put a few things on the table, and just, just so you guys are prepared, maybe this time we'll go, we'll go Dave, Jennifer, Mary, then Steve, but, um, you know, just, we, some of these issues have been teed up a little bit, whether it's spectrum sharing, whether it's, it's how quickly we get things to market, I mean, I, I you know, I will say, do we need more spectrum for, for mid-band, for example? Uh, you know, Mary pointed out the 530 megahertz and understand Steve's point, these things take a while, uh, although we've heard a lot about how quickly the 3450, 3550 historically now, you know, DOD looking at some, some other opportunities for lower and three gigahertz and all the Wi-Fi that's come on band, you know, is, is the Wi-Fi itch satisfied? You, you know, Mary, you pointed out some, some interesting other models there. Um, what's the impact of, you know, the advancements in efficiency in the technology itself, you know, do, just as we hear on the federal side, do you need as much spectrum as you need to get these missions done? What about on the commercial side? As you know, LTE was more efficient than 3G and 5G is more efficient. You know, what's the impact there? Um, do we need to look for bands that are suited for particular areas, whether it's, you know, UAVs or you know, autonomous transportation or, they, or, you know, these general purpose, or do we need to look at some things there as well? And what about in space, right? They're very important, you know, for the, for the U.S. government, for the president, for the Department of Commerce on leadership in space. What do we need there? And uh, it's a broad premise. I know it, it, it gets broken down more, particular spacecraft launches. You know, there, you know, we need maybe be a little more discreet than say, do we have enough spectrum for space, right? And then what about you know the, the persistent rural and underserved area? Do we have technologies here? Uh, you know, that that will help. So again, a lot on the table there. I, I leave it to you to, to to discuss how you want. Again, I've heard about collaboration. And again, I appreciate the CSMAC work. You know, are there other areas where that collaboration could help us move forward? So, so again, Dave, I'll start up with you this time. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to very quickly just uh, sort of jump onto one of the points that Mary was making there about um, enterprises' needs for, you know, I'm going to call it localized, uh, potentially cellular operations, right? Private cellular is a big topic in the industry these days, and. Um, you know, she mentioned the example in Germany where they've opened 3.7 to 3.8 for industrial uses. France has opened up portions of 2.6 for the same type of applications. Netherlands has 3.7 to 3.8. UK has 3.8 to 4.2 on a shared local licensing basis. So there's a lot of, uh, of countries that are seeing these needs and moving to make um, spectrum available for enterprises or industrial manufacturers. You know, um, my view is that CBRS will help uh, meet that need here in, in the U.S. largely uh, at either the GA or the PAL tier. Um, and, and you know, PALs can be obtained at the auction, which just concluded, or or via the secondary market. So, um, you know, uh, I think she's absolutely right that, uh, you know, Wi-Fi will meet a lot of the needs, but not all. And at the same time, 5G will meet many of the needs. Service provider um, sort of provisioned 5G will meet many of the needs, but not all. And, and that is an important uh, you know, spectrum uh, type or, or need that we need to also be taking into account with the strategy. So fully agree um, on your question, and it's really wide ranging. Um, but uh, Derek, I would say that, um, you know, my view is, uh, and Steve's probably better you know, qualified to speak to this, uh, but, you know, my view is it will take, you know, some amount of time for uh, you know, the mobile operators and industry in general to take advantage of the, you know, 280 megahertz in C-band, this new 100 megahertz um, at 3450 to 3550, and then the 150 megahertz of, of CBRS. Uh, again, we know who uh, who won the bids um, for the PALs now, but, um, you know, even, uh, you know, there's always the opportunity for people to utilize that at the GAA tier um, as well. So, um, yeah, that's going to take some time for us to see the, the build outs, although I, I expect the mobile industry is going to be very rapidly uh, to do that, uh, but to fully exploit it, it will take some time. Um, that said, I'll loop back to what I said earlier, which is that, um, you know, Fred and Kate were absolutely right, you know, 6G, next G, whatever we want to call it, you know, Wi-Fi 7, 
all of those things are, are you know, in active development at this point, at least, uh, well, can't call it Wi-Fi 7 yet, but 802.11.de is, uh, is a real thing, um, which presumably would be Wi-Fi 7 as our conversations about 6G. So I don't think it's too early for us to start talking about what the spectrum requirements are going to be and start thinking about, you know, how are we going to meet those? Um, you know, as I look at the mid-band, and we can argue about what mid-band means anymore. Um, I think the, it's a fungible definition these days. But, um, you know, as I think about mid-band spectrum for the future, and I do want to quickly touch on your efficiency topic because it's a good one. But, um, uh, you know, there's the conversations about 12 gigahertz, which is really a commercial, it's a commercial um, uh, situation. But then the seven and eight gigahertz bands, you know, obviously 3100 to um, uh, 3450 now are sort of near term. But as we think about sort of uh, longer term, I think seven and eight um, are, are an area that we should be talking about. There's a lot of commonality between some of the commercial operations in six and the federal operations in seven and eight. Uh, it's a large swath of spectrum and, and, you know, potentially we could do a lot with it. But um, again, the federal commercial sharing there would be key. So I think that's uh, one, one band that we should begin studying and, and that, you know, industry and, uh, and um, the government should be working on uh, looking at the possibilities there. Um, in terms of the efficiency question, and again, it is a good one. Um, you know, I think all users need to be striving for more spectral efficiency. You know, Mary rightly pointed out that, you know, when we talk about these next generation wireless technologies, a lot of times the speed benefits largely come from wider channel bandwidths, um, not surprisingly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do hope that, you know, we'll figure out ways to squeeze out more bits per hertz um, at the same time. And, you know, to my mind, that's not the only way to gauge spectral efficiency. A lot about spectral efficiency is about reuse. Um, and, and that's where, in my mind, sharing really plays a role. I mean, Mary talked about six gigahertz unlicensed as an underlay, right? Those, um, you know, microwave services continue to operate, other incumbent services in the subbands continue to operate, and unlicensed is able to come in and make use of the spectrum um, in areas and at power levels where it doesn't impact those incumbent services. That's a heck of a lot of efficiency you're getting out of that band all of a sudden. Um, so, you know, I think those are, you know, spectrum sharing to improve reuse is a key way that we get more spectrally efficient. And then finally, I would say we also need to look at band edge interactions very closely, um, you know, as a, a you know, again, representing the CBRS ecosystem. You know, we're now looking very closely at the interactions between CBRS and higher power C band operations at the 3700 band edge and now also potentially, um, CBRS, uh, including PAL and ESC operations uh, at the lower edge, 3550, with the proposed um, higher power operations in the 3450 to 3550 range. So I think industry is going to need to look at, you know, what can we do filtering wise and um, just equipment wise to make sure that uh, that energy, you know, essentially high power energy from one band doesn't impact operations in another. Thank you. No, Dave, appreciate it. And I mean, you raise you raise a good issue there too. On as we as we pack more bands and we make these decisions and we initially make them availability. Lots of times we need to come back and 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 look at a lot of the technical rules. And I know we've done that on CBRS. And and, and you raise these these band dash issues will be important. And again, at 3450, 3550, we we've looked at that and lessons learned from CBRS. And one one of the inputs there was you know make this higher power. So you know we want to do that. What does that mean? So certainly very interesting. Um, Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, and I agree with Dave. That was a broad question, so I'm going to just focus on a couple a couple points there. Um, in terms of additional spectrum um, for space, um, space, regardless of which element of it, has a, a pretty strong history of sharing among and within the space community. So there's really very little that's exclusive. There's a lot of um, collaboration and um, have have always done fairly well. I think the challenge is to ensure that there remains the access that allows for that dynamic use by multiple parties of, of bands of spectrum. It becomes more challenging in a non-satellite sharing context um, when new users, terrestrial or otherwise, are, are brought in that 
um, sharing environment that has worked and accommodated so many uses becomes a little bit more constrained and actually can, can have some significant impacts on, on business models and um, competition. So the question really in, in, in our mind, I guess, is how do we make sure that there is adequate spectrum to support the concepts that kind of are designed to coexist already. And um, as the, one of the few areas, though, that, that's kind of new and novel that um, is even on the WRC agenda is suborbital vehicles and what is necessary to enable suborbital sub vehicles. That's a very important question for the WRC. And as you can appreciate, as suborbital vehicles may start in one country and land in another, um, that's an even more unique case for harmonized spectrum <laughs> because you are going to want to be able to probably launch and land using the same spectrum and not have to be burdened with um, heavier equipment and, and um, more complications than necessary. Um, in terms of um, kind of the manufacturing side, though, on spectrum, I think it's what Mary and, and Dave said about kind of enterprise operations, obviously is important, but it's also the um, persist, persistent access for the R&D and testing that U.S. manufacturing sites do, which is a little different than their comms networks. And so how do we work with the um, experimental licensing systems that, you know, quite frankly, both agencies have um, to ensure that they are supporting um, the U.S. manufacturing industry writ large. And it's really, the experimental licensing to me is the unsung gem of the FCC um, licensing um, process. It's, it's, it's really the engine of innovation. It allows for so much to happen and ideas to be tested and proven and taken to maturity levels to decide what gets into the commercial market and what doesn't or in, you know, into any market, civil or defense as well. Um, how do we make sure that as spectrum policy uh, makes changes to bands in which there has been a thriving experimental use, that there isn't an, 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 um, an unexpected consequence um, that deprives uh, manufacturing industries from access to that spectrum and the terms and conditions of before. So it's just, it's one of those things you have to take into account as consequential decisions and maybe factoring that in up front so that we can continue to have a, um, a strong U.S. manufacturing base in those areas that we already lead, let alone in areas we want to lead. Um, and then um, I think looking at spectrum sharing and going into the future, I think we all are going to really need to depend, as, as I think Mary said and, and Fred, on AI. AI is going to be the crux of being able to do that type of sharing that's going to allow us to address things that we haven't really talked about here on this panel, which are more the security issues, export issues of, of information. There's all sorts of, of ways to address restrictions on the sharing of information through AI-controlled systems that may be U.S. based, but that impact um, U.S. and foreign entities that operate in the U.S. market. And I think we really need to, to, to lean forward into that. Um, and that's a, an area which I imagine NTIA, the federal government, and um, the FCC will, will heavily co uh, collaborate. Then, of course, ORAN we see as a really important um, for the um, diversity of supply chain uh, future. So I'll leave it at that and turn it back to you. Thank you, Jennifer. First, some great topics there, and yes, an intensely broad question that certainly has brought some uh, some different answers, which is which is great. Uh, Mary, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, second, the ORAN view. Uh, uh, we think that is very important to uh, to increasing supplier diversity uh, in the mobile industry, which we we sorely need. We need we need more U.S. companies involved. Uh, in the uh, 3GPP uh, community. Um, I guess my, my uh, to digest on the commercial side, <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to what's happened over the past few years. We need to see how the mobile industry is going to innovate in the millimeter wave space to provide innovative new services. Um, 
uh, Steve's comments about uh, spectral reuse in the mid band, I think are very appropriate. We need to understand what are the, what are the capabilities of that spectrum given how much can we really bring out of mid band spectrum uh, is really going to inform where we need to go next. Um, uh, you know, from the Wi-Fi community perspective, we just got access to 1200 megahertz of spectrum. And now is the time we need to innovate uh, from a technology and a solutions perspective. Dave mentioned we already have Wi-Fi 7 in the standards process. Uh, and that is proceeding uh, even as even as the cellular industry talks about moving to their next uh, stage of evolution going forward. So we have a lot on our plate. Um, uh, and uh, understanding how that's going to play out and watching how that plays out, I think it's going to be um, extremely informative. Um, I'll add just one additional thought that I haven't heard so far about this topic um, of spectrum sharing. Um, and it's really come home to roost uh, for me in the six gigahertz process as that begins to unfold globally. Um, in, in six gigahertz here in the US, we have an option for higher power Wi-Fi that can be both indoors and outdoors, but it must be subject to database control in order to avoid incumbent uh, operations to protect those microwave operations. So this is a, again, another first for the Wi-Fi industry. We've never worked with databases before. Uh, so here we go. We're going to join the join the club. Um, when we go abroad, um, the capability for this kind of advanced sharing is pretty limited. Even in economies that are we would consider advanced, we would consider top tier. Um, often their license files are sitting in someone's file cabinet, and it doesn't really enable the kinds of advanced solutions that we're playing around with here or that we're thinking about for the future. And, and I think it is in our US interests, in our national interests, I'm sure Dave will agree with me, that we come up with, um, when, we, when we think about how we're gonna share here in the US, that we think about whether those ideas in some way, shape or form are exportable globally. Right, because from a from the perspective of a global manufacturer, it's great that the U.S. is going to do something, but I really need access to the world. Um, and uh, whether that's streamlined versions of what we're doing or whatever it is, um, we need to keep our eye on how are we impacting the uh, sort of the global community in which we operate. I think it's it's incredibly important, and it's not really been part of the conversation yet. But I think it, it needs to be based on what I've seen so far coming out of the six gigahertz proceeding. So with that, I will stop because I know we're, we're nearing time and turn it over to the next panelist. Oh, Mary, thank you. That, that, that is really, really, uh, you know, helpful. And on, on that, I actually was going to ask a question later, which I'm not going to have time for, but, but is, your, is your thinking on that, is, is it through private sector standards bodies? Is that through government, the government, is that IT, you know, where, what, what type of forum would, Really good questions, Derek, and I don't have the answers. I mean, so much of this depends upon the maturity of governments to have um, access to data. I mean, Fred talked about the problems we've got in, in the U.S. government trying to organize our data so that we can actually make informed decisions quickly. <laughs> well, take 10 steps back for some of these some of these countries, even advanced European countries. I mean, they just don't have data um, that exists in a database format. Their licensing records are not online. They, they just don't have it. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a private sector uh, issue that can be solved. Um, it's really, it's got to be the governments themselves in cooperation with industry with this as a broader international goal, I think, going forward. Got it. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to ask you one more because we, we do have some audience questions coming in. And just one quick one for you, Mary, while you were on six gigahertz. We had a question about the current status of commercial availability of the low power indoor devices. Is there any anything on that? Might be able to say. 
Well, uh, the FCC is closing comments on proposed testing of those devices at the end of this week. So we don't even have the FCC tests yet. So we don't know how to test the equipment. Um, and that will be coming out presumably uh, in October, uh, I would guess is my best guess. Um, the, the view from industry is while there may be some low power devices available uh, by the end of the year, uh, we're not likely to see uh, uh, a significant number of devices moving through the FCC approval process until the uh, calendar. That's the trajectory that most, uh, most companies are on. Thank you, appreciate it. So Steve, it is back to you. I know you you previewed a little bit on, you know, looking forward, um, you know, again, I know a, a big focus on spectrum availability. We, we talked a lot about spectrum sharing and earlier today, Charles Cooper talked about, you know, anti looking at more more automated and informant, uh, incumbent informing capabilities. Uh, you know, obviously you're, you know, you heard from Warfield stock and then, you know, your view. So, you know, looking, looking forward now, you know, what are, what are some things you, you'd like to see us work on in, in this space? Well, I think I agree with Dave. It's never too late to start looking at the next uh, spectrum bands, right? And, and how to make that available. And we've certainly, I think, looking at 3.1 to 3.45 um, gigahertz is high on our on our agenda um, uh, to look at it. And you, you know, one of the things that you asked about is rural and solving a rural problem. And um, I'll say with our one of the commitments we made with our merger with Sprint was that we would cover. 99% uh, of the US POPs at um, 50 megabits per second or greater, and that includes 90% of the rural um, POPs at 90 or 50 megabits per second or greater. So these are, you know, speeds and coverage that we have not had before in the US, and it all comes down to being able to um, obtain and, and uh, deploy spectrum very quickly to, to meet those goals. Um, you know, one of the challenges, and you know, it related to spectrum, but really that the rural area, the rural rural coverage issue is still citing. Um, and we've, uh, you know, we've made progress. The FCC has had some very good decisions to help us um, with citing and move citing along uh, more quickly. But I think we still need more action. You know, action from Congress on on, um, on citing requirements and. A, uh, there's been some progress on the federal side around national parks or, um, uh, you know, military bases, access to that. But we're still seeing, you know, we still see uh, obstacles to deploying in these very rural areas where you can get into some siting restrictions. And that's not small cell, right? That's, you know, that's tall tower, um, wide area coverage, um, coverage systems. And I will say, you know, uh, on looking at spectrum bands, we, we are, the cycle on us um, digesting spectrum that's available has increased significantly. With the 600 megahertz auction, we began deploying that spectrum within about five weeks of getting our licenses from the FCC. Closing the Sprint merger, we started turning 5G on two and a half gigahertz um, bands within a day of closing that merger. And you know, so our ability to digest spectrum, we're not the industry doesn't now, you know, wait until an allocation is done and an auction is held to begin working to deploy that spectrum. We're we're laying that foundation years in advance in anticipation of it becoming available. So we're able to, you know, to begin deploying that very quickly. And you know, we're actually deploying about a hundred sites a day for 5G right now to build out our our nationwide 5G um, uh, system network. So, you know, I think next steps are really, you know, continuing to, you know, to look at how to improve that. Uh, let me, I think one um, area where we should not be going is away from a very competitive model that's been successful. And I'll just touch on, you know, Fred talked about the DOD RFI and he focused on um, the sharing discussion that's part of that RFI and how that can be advanced. Um, uh, you know, it is a little daunting that the first question of the RFI is how does DOD, um, you know, build and deploy and run a 5G network that would be shared and, you know, to more of a government controlled network. 
um, as opposed to a competitively deployed network run by commercial operators. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing we need to be wary about and promises made around the success of something like that versus the, you know, the global leadership that we've had with competitive models in a highly competitive um, environment that we, you know, we should be building and trying to make sure that the resources are available to um, uh, sustain and accelerate that, which, you know, which we are seeing and need to, to continue to support by uh, both making the spectrum available and helping to break down some of the roadblocks on deployment like siting. Thank you, appreciate it. So I think we are really pressed for time here. What I'm gonna do is turn it to everybody if you want like another minute or two to, to sort of give any concluding thoughts, although I know we were very forward looking there. And um, Jennifer, I'll turn to you first. I, I will get a bonus question here from an audience member who you had raised this sharing by design. And the question was whether, you know, the defense industry now is involved in that. And are there any programs or technologies being standardized that, that could have an impact here? Or is it something I think maybe you were more suggesting is a little, you know, we need to get started on that. So there's not a formal um, design process in place or formal um, contractual relationships among, among um, industry sectors. There is under the auspices of the National Defense Industry Association, a working group that got stood up at, um, I think, good forward-looking initiative of um, the Department of Defense and Under Secretary Lord to um, bring together uh, the OEMs on both sides, as well as some of the service providers and software providers to start start having this dialogue. And, you know, there are um, technical and operational discussions underway, as well as regulatory. And that's a starting point. Um, it's only, it's, okay, I want to say a couple of months now. I forget, Steve's involved as well. I think maybe two months, three months. So that's, as I said, a starting point. Um, the, um, my closing comments would really be to pick up on something that, that Mary mentioned um, in terms of the importance of the global environment. We often talk about global harmonization of spectrum and standards, but what we don't talk about is the what's necessary to harmonize that spectrum. So spectrum sharing, when we come up with domestic solutions, we are very reticent to share how we arrived at those conclusions with the rest of the world and bringing them into like the ITU. Very few countries around the world, even the most advanced, have the technical resources in one regulator, let alone the two that we have, to um, re redo all of the work that has taken a year, two years, three years for our proceedings to come to conclusions and depend upon. So um, from, from where I sit, it's very important that these the regulatory sharing methodologies be part of the um, global harmonization of spectrum efforts. And sometimes we're our, we're our own worst enemy in achieving that. Um, it should not have any implications for national sovereignty. It's merely sharing of information, just like we want to share spectrum. And we'll do better at sharing spectrum if we share how to. Uh, and that would be my, my closing remark. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Mary, any, any final thoughts from you? Uh, I agree with everything Jennifer just said. <laughs> My closing remarks. Um, no, I, I mean, hearkening back again to the first panel, um, you know, we, we talk about the need for best practices and we talk about the need for more open and transparent communication. And I think um, uh, one of the things that we can do, um, both as industry, but also uh, you know, with respect to the federal agencies, NTIA and FCC, is redouble our efforts to work together uh, better. Um, that that will be enhanced someday uh, by the release of a national spectrum strategy. I hope, um, but uh, but even in the absence of that strategy, uh, I think uh, I think we need to really uh, to work on how we communicate and make sure. Um, that we're communicating early and understanding uh, concerns and uh, parsing the engineering disagreements uh, more quickly and and running those to ground. So uh, my hope is that uh, um, given the demands on spectrum from all sides, 
uh, that uh, that that uh, collaboration can be enhanced going forward. And that's that's it. Thanks. All right. Thank All right. you, Terry. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and Dave, uh, some any, any final thoughts? Sure. Uh, licensed, unlicensed, shared spectrum, we need them all uh, as a nation. And since you know the focus here has really been on sharing, I'll just agree with um, Jennifer and Mary that um, you know, it is important that uh, you know, the U.S. continues to lead in spectrum sharing, but that we also share that knowledge um, internationally as appropriate. Um, I'd point out that you know, every sharing regime is going to be different, depending on the geography, depending on the band characteristics, the incumbents you're protecting. The new services you may be trying to introduce, and that kind of goes back to Fred's thing that, you know, Fred's point that you've got to start, um, you know, with that North Star of where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish? And I fully agree with that. But, um, you know, I, I, there are definitely things that we've done in CBRS that are applicable at a relatively generic level protocol interfaces, for instance. Um, you know, Charles mentioned earlier in, uh, the, the info, and I can never get the acronym right, the uh, informing incumbent capability that's being discussed for 3450 to 3550. I think that is a, a really an important um, you know, mechanism. It could uh, help address some of the time to market issues that Jennifer mentioned and Steve mentioned with CBRS's development. And frankly, I think it would also be a little bit more generalized, so it could be more easily you know, applied to other bands, other geographies. Um, so we're excited to see what happens there, and and then also to talk about whether it sort of has retroactive uh, applicability to CBRS. As Fred said, they want to go back at some point and look at the rules. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. And uh, last but not least, please, Steve, uh, you. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Yeah, and great comments by Dave, Jennifer, and Mary. All, you know, I really agree with uh, everything, everything everybody has said. Uh, it, and I also, I didn't spend any time really talking about the international issues, but I fully agree with what's been discussed there, right? I mean, it is um, uh, key to what we do and, and very important. But I really, you know, Mary uh, hit the nail on the head with the comment about we need to, uh, you know, continue to figure out a way to work better together and to build trust. And um, we've been doing this for a long time and it's really, you know, getting a trusting relationship between the federal agencies and the uh, commercial sector to work through these issues is, is really the key to success. And we should all view this as, you know, being in together for uh, the success of the country and, um, you know, finding a way to solve those problems and work cooperatively. Uh, to make sure that as we're moving into new technologies uh, and new ways to share spectrum, we also don't lose the momentum that's made the uh, country so successful um, so far. And, you know, we've got to keep that engine going as we look at new ways of doing things. With that, I'll turn it back. But thank you very much for uh, this was a great discussion. Thank you very much, and Steve. Those those were great final words. I couldn't couldn't set up it myself. And and from the NTI perspective, you know, we really really do get a lot out of working with industry and our collaboration. And you know, our our doors, virtual or in person, are always open. Uh, so we look forward to ongoing collaboration. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, I, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour. Uh, I know we're sort of the spectrum walks here, but uh, again, thank you all very much. And I think we had a crowd here. We would we would do the applause now, but I guess they're virtual. So thank you very much again for, for, for uh, your participation today and, and thank you audience for tuning in. And I'm gonna send it back now to, uh, to Charles Cooper. Thank you, Derek, and for all the panelists in, in, uh, in panel two and also for panel one. Uh, drawing a kind of a common theme that I was hearing between the two panels was the, the need for a um, uh, to, to set a standard, if you will, in terms of how we assess the spectrum for repurposing, you know, be it the propagation models, the process, et cetera, uh, it's it's important for us. Uh, I think was mentioned in both panel one and panel two for us to determine that uh, that commonality, which would increase the efficiency of that. Um, would also brought to my attention were the comments about it's not only spectrum, but it's also the spectrum efficiency. Um, you know, w w allowing us to use it more more effectively and efficiently. And uh, what really struck me as well were Steve's comments about the. Um, about the beam forming techniques and the beam steering, allowing eight simultaneous users with 750 megabits per second. Um, and furthermore, it's not always about 5G, but it's about uh, the U.S. manufacturing uh, as well and, and the requirement that they have to maintain 
uh, their access to the spectrum. All great, all great parts. Um, summarizing uh, some of the other thoughts, uh, just real back for real, real briefly for the folks who may be joining in late. Uh, Secretary Ross started us off, and um, he reiterated the three uh, prime principles for the administration and for the department. Uh, number one is is widespread adoption of 5G, and especially those related to the high bandwidth uh, applications. Uh, number two was space commerce, which not only are satellites, but uh, uh, satellite sensing as well in the passive bands. And of course, number three, the security integrity of the infrastructure. That was followed up by uh, OSTP Director Dr. Duggermeyer, uh, kind of discussing, kind of looking behind the scenes of how we were able to accomplish uh, identifying the 3450 to 3550 megahertz spectrum so quickly. And the three uh, issues that he identified was number one, a clear mandate, you know, coming from up above what the direction is and what the bookends are to, to get that uh, effectuated. Uh, and of course, having having the best caliber, the top notch people, as as uh, Kelvin mentioned. And, you know, when it all comes down to together, it's working as a team. You know, this is very, it's a very people focused industry. Um, then our third and final keynote was from uh, Administrator, NTIA Administrator Adam Kandu, uh, bringing out the foundational work that NTIA and Office of Spectrum Management did in the 3450 to 3550 earlier work, um, and also laying it down for NTIA to, uh, to continue to be part of that conversation in spectrum management. So with that said, I will have the privilege of wrapping up another the uh, third annual Spectrum Symposium. Thank you again to all the panelists and to the keynote speakers. And uh, as a uh, bookkeeping item, we will be posting this uh, as an archive version at some point in the future on the NTIA website. So thank you very much. And I also would like to really appreciate the, um, uh, the NTI team that put this together. Uh, Dave Reed, um, Eric Rosenberg, John Allen, and Antonio Richardson, along with others in the NTIA front office, including the Office of Public Affairs. Thank you so much for doing this. Have a good day, everyone.